We are recording and this will be um, recorded, you know, and available on the public record. So, uh, thank you, Eric. All right. So here's a new slide. Um, so this will be a review uh, for those of you who are here on Wednesday, but I, I, let me just start by addressing a couple of questions that many folks have been wondering, and it was apparent on Wednesday. First, what is this new study and how does it relate to previous Alawise studies? And second, sorry, I'm getting a message that you guys are not seeing anything. Is that correct? Are you guys seeing my slides? Okay. We are. You're seeing it? Okay. For some reason, Cindy is not seeing it. Okay. Okay, great. All right, thanks. Sounds like most people are. Cindy, I don't know what your issue is, but hopefully it will catch up. Okay. Um, so uh, the questions are, you know, um, first, you know, what is this new study? Um, how does it relate to previous studies? And second, since stakeholders have already provided, you know, tons of input uh, to previous versions of this study, what happened to that input and, and why are we having another round of public meetings? Uh, so I'll just, uh, for now, I'll say briefly that we've been given an opportunity uh, to take a completely fresh look at how to reduce the impacts of flooding with fewer restrictions than previous studies had. So you can see some of that on the slide. As such, um, we're going to consider totally new ideas. Hopefully there are some, um, as well as to reconsider ideas that maybe were eliminated in some of our previous analyses. So uh, on the one hand, we're open to fresh perspectives. Uh, we don't want old habits of thought to bias our analysis at the start of this new study. But at the same time, we will be able to incorporate a lot of useful data and public input from previous studies. Uh, so we haven't forgotten those ideas that stakeholders have provided. We have them on file and we will take a fresh look at them but also because we are launching a new study process, we want to make sure that you all have an opportunity to contribute as much and as early as possible to that process. Um, that is a lesson that we certainly have learned. And I just want to also, uh, before we get to our opening remarks, uh, you know, just mention a few things that we heard on Wednesday. Um, you know, Trust, uh, you know, there were, there were a number of concerns that we heard from folks, uh, and we hear those and we understand them. The first one, and probably the biggest and most fundamental, is trust. Um, so there's, there's an emphatic sense that the level of trust between the core and the community is just not where it needs to be. Um, on the bright side for us, I mean, I think people want to have a healthy and trusting relationship uh, with the Corps of Engineers. Um, but, you know, clearly a lot of folks feel that we have not earned that yet. So we have a lot of work to do. Um, second thing, a, a lot of people mentioned that uh, they want more opportunities for genuinely substantive participation in planning and decision making processes. And I think that's both quantity and quality, right? There's more opportunities literally, but also more substantive uh, people would like to have. Uh, third thing is folks feel that the study process is, is narrowly focused and that it's biased towards certain kinds of solutions, such as concrete versus natural and nature-based solutions. Uh, and by the way, I'm not going to be, you know, rebutting or commenting on any of these at this point. Um, we can address them later, um, but I, I just want to, you know, these are things that we heard and, and we really uh, understand people's perspectives about these uh, these concerns. So the fourth one is uh, the, the study process takes too long. Um, pe you know, people feel like there are a number of uh, kind of low hanging fruit that are kind of obvious and why don't we just go ahead and do those? I um, heard that a number of times. Uh, a new plan uh, will require new funds to be appropriated by Congress in order to implement is another concern. And then finally, why, why ask us for input Again, since we've already provided a lot of input, um, you know, multiple times. Um, so these, these are just a few of the things, and there were, of course, other things as well. But those were some concerns that we heard. Um, and we also heard some positives. So, you know, there was praise and trust uh, for individual staff, um, especially Jeff, uh, Jeff Herzog and Cindy Paul, 
um, there was agreement, you know, broad agreement that some kind of uh, flood management solution is necessary. Um, people felt excited that there's a, a new lease on life for, for some of the ideas that were previously eliminated. Uh, people felt optimism that this time an appropriate plan can finally be realized. Um, also optimism that um, uh, the mayor's administration will work uh, with, with the court to get it right this time. Um, and, and, and gratitude for an opportunity to provide input uh, given that we have this new study process. So our agenda today, um, we're in the midst of our introduction. We will shortly have our opening remarks uh, from the commander of Honolulu District and the mayor of Honolulu. Um, we will then have, again, a, a brief presentation on why we're here and giving an overview of the study process. Uh, and then we'll get to our exercises. Um, so our tool is back up and running. Uh, Crowdsource Reporter is our mapping tool. We're going to use that in the exercises and also facilitate some, some small group discussions in there. Um, and then eventually uh, at the end, we'll get to our, our question and answer session. Okay. So now we're privileged to hear uh, some brief opening remarks uh, from Lieutenant Colonel Marshall, uh, Eric Marshall, Commander of the Corps Honolulu District, and Mr. Rick Blangiardi, the Mayor of Honolulu. Um, both of them I could say a lot more things about. They've both had illustrious careers. I'm just going to, in the interest of time, mention a couple of quick highlights for each. Um, for the commander, um, he managed critically important projects uh, in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. Uh, he served in Afghanistan and was awarded a Bronze Star Medal. Uh, and he has a master's in nuclear engineering from MIT and was a professor of physics at West Point. Uh, so he brings both broad experience and deep expertise to his role as commander, which will serve him well as he oversees this important study. Sir, the floor is yours. Thanks, Tyson. Aloha and uh, good afternoon, everybody. It really is my privilege to be a part of this public meeting uh, with all of you today. Um, the Alawai project is, is definitely near and dear to my heart. We had a, we had a fantastic first meeting on Wednesday night uh, this past week. Uh, the audience was fully engaged, um, generous and respectful with their both informed and, and educated comments. Um, I'm telling you, it was impactful. Um, it, really, it really, really was. Um, there were two, there were probably two themes that you're going to, themes that you're going to hear reiterated and re repeated by the project team um, over the next hour or so, a couple hours. And uh, these, these are the two themes. Number one, uh, this is not the same Alawai project that started in 1999. It is, is a very different project. Um, please tune in to those differences. But the second big theme is that we are listening. Uh, your, your comments over the past 10 to 15 years of, of public meetings uh, were received and they've made a, they've made a difference, um, a significant difference. And, you know, in just a, uh, you know, in a small way, you know, one of the comments we received on Wednesday night was that maybe, maybe my opening remarks were too long. So I'm going to make this one a lot quicker, uh, despite how hilarious uh, my personal story was for those of you that were there. We're just going to avoid all that. Um, but uh, it, I would be remiss to talk about how, you know, the Ottawa project that, that previously existed actually you know, under my tenure, it well, it, it died. Uh, you know, it was uh, it was a project that was um, authorized to find the 100-year uh, level of protection, is what we might say, or uh, to to provide uh, storm uh, risk damage reduction, uh, flood risk management for the 100-year storm. And that's a very large storm, and it requires uh, you know, very imposing and large structures. Um, I'm, I'm very happy that under this new study, this new authorization, we have federal authority to design for a level of protection other than that 1% storm or that 100-year storm. In fact, we aim to find the optimal level of protection that maximizes the benefits to the community. And, and that is an altogether different approach. So all the comments that received over the past uh, you know, 10 to 15 years and the previous uh, studies and designs, that has led us to this point where we're in a new phase of the project. And I'm, I'm for one, very optimistic about what, what it could um, you know, what the future could unfold uh, as far as how this project could, could shape up. Um, but, we need, but we need your involvement. 
Uh, we are, I'm, I'm asking you to continue uh, the trend that we had. We started on Wednesday with respectful dialogue, uh, informed comments, um, diligently putting those those comments in either the chat bar or in the um, in the GIS product in the work groups that we're about to be split out into, and it will be very productive. I, I assure you, um, we are committed to to real engagement. You know, communicating uh, about the project, listening to you, and hearing your your uh, your comments, and including that in the project where where we can. Ultimately, that that's what we need to do to build trust, um, and I, I think we can I think we can do that. So all this will be accomplished this afternoon. I'm very thankful for your civic participation. Those of you on the second go of this, very much needed and appreciated. Uh, it makes us better. And I also wanna thank uh, the city and county of Honolulu really for the excellent partnership that we've had with you since your administration took over. Um, it's, it's really been a pleasure working with Alawai as well as other projects um, that, that we're working together. So with that, I'll, I'll uh, end and turn it to Mayor Blangiardi. Thank you. Thank you, Colonel Marshall. Look, I will be brief as well, but let me first of all welcome all of you that are on this call today and thank you for caring enough about our home to participate in something like this. And look, I, I will tell you, I'm um, very indebted, as Colonel Marshall just said, uh, with respect to the Army Corps of Engineers and, and their embrace, if you will. This project was dead in the water in December before we ever got sworn in. I had a meeting in here with, with Mayor Caldwell and Colonel Marshall, and, and it was Pretty much, you know, the funding had exceeded all prior limitations and expectations. And so they were going to just walk away. And we knew, I knew personally that this project, which I've said throughout, even during the campaign, was absolutely vital for Hawaii's future, for Oahu's future. So the fact that we're back at the plate again and not thrown into some tailspin of a multi year, possibly even Senator Schatz told me maybe it could be as many as 10 years before we get a chance again was very daunting. So here we are. Our game plan is really simple today. It's to gain, as Colonel Marshall just said, your perspectives, fresh perspectives in earnest, and to the extent possible as we go through this process to build your trust. So I'm here to listen. We we're here the other night. It was very educational. I'll be on here today. I've got a hot out at 3.15 if we're still on the call. But I want to introduce you to Alex Kozlov. He's an important voice in this. Alex came to us as part of our administration. He's in charge of design and construction. He's built projects all over the world, uh, but most notably, I think also because of his experience in the military in the Army Reserve, he's a one-star general. He understands the Army Corps of Engineers as well. It gives us an incredible liaison uh, with the Army, if you will, from the standpoint of Alex's experience and perspective. And we go into this journey with you, very excited and very confident that this time, I just heard Colonel Marshall talk about since 1999, it's pretty amazing. This time, we're going to get it. We're going to get it right. So with that, Alex. Aloha and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for spending your uh, your Saturday afternoon with us uh, on this thing. I'm I'm personally very excited about where we are, uh, taking a, a fresh and really innovative look uh, at uh, how we solve this very complicated, uh, very, very challenging project uh, going forward regarding the Alawai watershed. Uh, some themes that, that I would uh, ask you to continue to, th to think about as we go through the exercise today. Uh, number one, that this is really just step one, step one of many, many steps. It sets the stage for how we go forward with this, uh, but this is the, 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 the first of, of many uh, interactions, the first, of, uh, first step of a lot of hard work going forward and how we develop a solution for this. The, the, the solution is, uh, or the, the process for this is, is a much bigger aperture than before. We're no longer uh, bound by any particular or any um, level of protection, uh, any, any single level of protection. We're looking at trying to find the optimum solution. Uh, and that is kind of hard to, to, to understand uh, uh, and grasp. And we hope to answer that question as today goes on, how we're gonna do that. Um, their bottom line is that all options are on the table. This is a huge aperture. There's no um, uh, nothing that we that that will not be considered, um, and 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 including the previous materials of the previous study. Um, those materials are available. Um, uh, the data is, and that data will be reviewed and considered. The conclusions won't though. This is not an exercise of a conclusion in search of facts. This is an exercise of facts in search of the right conclusion at the end of the day. And that's what we want to do is is do some fact uh, checking, fact seeking, and then come up with the right optimum plan at the, at the end of the day. 
Um, we have this new technology today called Crowdsource Reporter. Uh, you'll you'll see that uh, in in the next uh, few minutes and, uh, and in the breakout sessions. Uh, that is uh, one of several tools that you can use to provide your input. But but here's what I learned from Wednesday um, is that the, the, how we're capturing this information, the best way to get your ideas across, the best way to get your idea is to type something. Type it on Crowdsource Reporter, type it on chat, send an email, go to the LOI website and include something there. Typing gets it formalized. It's something that we can read and review and digest and, and produce an answer to. Um, so, so if you're going to do one thing, uh, spend your time with your fingers and, and type something somewhere. Uh, that's probably the best way. Um, that's that that concludes kind of my intro, uh, hoping to answer questions as the afternoon uh, progresses. Um, and I'd like to just really thank the Corps of Engineers for coming to the table on this. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a good process that, uh, that a lot of people spend a lot of time, uh, trying to get to where we are and we'll continue that work. So thanks Corps of Engineers and thanks everybody for participating this afternoon. Appreciate that Mr. Mayor and Alex, um, you know. Something to just that I want to mention briefly before we go on is um, Alex uh, and his colleagues have been extremely involved and engaged in this process from the beginning. And that's not something that every project sponsor does, um, but he, they have been really advocating for the community and uh, making sure that, you know, we're going to have public input uh, and, and, uh, and all of that stuff. So, um, uh, yeah, so kudos to them. All right, let's, uh, okay. So again, for those of you who are here on Wednesday, this is review, but you know, some ground rules uh, for our time here together, um, please participate. That is kind of the whole point of uh, doing this is to gather your input, uh, let you know a few things, but mainly to get uh, input from you. Um, <clears throat> We want to work together as a team. Uh, you know, we really consider our stakeholders to be members of our extended planning team. Um, so let's let's work together constructively and collaboratively uh, because this is a new study. Let's stay open to those fresh perspectives. Uh, and as we've already been talking about, you know, post your your comments and questions in the chat, or you can hold on to them until the the Q and A if you like. Um, and then to keep your audio on mute unless you're speaking. I think we're already all, all doing that. Um, if you do have any technical difficulties, you know, feel free to let us know in the chat or send me an email. Um, you can do that at any time, even after the workshop is done. Uh, if you want to work with Crowdsource Reporter and you encounter some issues with it, you know, feel free to, uh, to send me an email so we can get that straightened out for you. All right, and I'm going to uh, hand this over now. Uh, we've got a little presentation um, for you. I'm going to hand it over to project manager Cindy Ockpal. Hello, everyone. My name is Cindy Ockpal, and I'm a project manager with the Army Corps of Engineers. And presenting alongside me will be Eric Merriam, the lead planner for this general reevaluation study. Our lead facilitator today is Tyson Vaughn of the Collaboration and Public Participation Center of Expertise. And also, we have several project team members on the line from both the Army Corps of Engineers and the City and County of Honolulu. From the Army Corps of Engineers, we have Kelly Philbin, Elliot Porter, Jeff Herzog, and Vera Coskello. And from the City and County of Honolulu, we have on the line Mike Formby. Oh, I'm sorry, not Mike Formby. Alex Kozlov, Matt Gonzer, and Tim Sakahara. The members listed as facil facilitators will be helping to facilitate the breakout rooms, and both facilitators and discussants will help to answer any questions that you may have during the Q&A session at the end. Next slide, please. All right, so this slide focuses on why are we here and what are the known risks? The Alawai watershed, which is the focus of our study, encompasses both or the Makiki, Manoa, and Palolo streams, all which drain into the Alawai Canal. The canal is a man-made feature constructed in the 1920s to drain the wetlands. Its original design was not intended to be a flood control measure. 
Overtopping of the canal has previously flooded Waikiki and its surrounding Malkasai neighborhoods multiple times, including the November 1965 and December 1967 storms and during the passage of Hurricane Iniki in 1992. The upstream areas are also at risk of flooding as demonstrated in the October 2004 and March 2006 storms. The 2004 Manoa flood was estimated to be somewhere between a 25 and 50 year storm and caused $86 million in damages at the University of Hawaii. In 2006, there was a 40 days and 40 nights of rain that wasn't associated with any specific size storm event, but caused widespread flooding throughout the watershed. These flood risks have the possibility to substantially impact the approximately 200,000 residents living and working in the watershed. Some of these residents living in the floodplain would be directly impacted. Others who work or go to school or are just visiting temporarily may be indirectly impacted. Here we look at the life safety risk. In fact, just the other day, one of the participants in my group mentioned that the reason why he got involved in this project in the first place was because he was on the University of Hawaii at Manoa campus during that October 2004 flood. He had to pull a lady out of the water to safety off of East West Road. Hearing stories like this makes me realize how fortunate that more fatalities do not exist for these types of flood events. We look at the life safety risk, not only from these types of direct flooding impacts, but also from an indirect perspective, such as access to emergency shelters, the ability for first responders to get to you in a timely manner, or with the closure of any major thoroughfare, such as the ones we've seen several times on the H1 at Liliha due to flooding. In addition to life safety risk, there's also the economic importance of this watershed, not only for the tourism in Waikiki, but also for the multiple mom and pop stores, all the businesses throughout the watershed, up at Manoa Marketplace, over in Paksali, Makali, Mo'ili'ili, Statistics show that this watershed pre COVID times generates 8% of the gross state product valuing approximately $5 billion. It accounts for 11% of civilian jobs in the state, 42% of the state's visitor industry revenue, 12% of the state and county tax revenue. From an economic perspective, this is one of the most important watersheds in the state of Hawaii. Finally, there are also a number of critical facilities such as hospitals fire stations, police stations, schools, and emergency shelters. Given the urban density of this watershed, there is a relatively high volume of what is considered to be critical infrastructure in this area, much of which is located within the potential floodplain. This reduces the ability for a quick recovery from any poten potential flood events. The map over here shows the maximum possible extent of a 1% annual exceedance probability, also known as a 100-year storm, as was identified in the current modeling. This simply shows the extent or the footprint of the potentially impacted area within the watershed. Next slide, please. Now, this isn't the first time that flood risk in this watershed has been studied. This project's been around since 1999, but here's some recent history. The feasibility study of 2017 resulted in project authorization in 2018. Once we moved into the design phase, we now had the funding and opportunity to update some of the technical analysis, such as the hydrology and hydraulics with the most up-to-date technology. At that point, it became evident that modifications were going to be needed in order for that system to function at the same level of performance that was authorized, specific to the 1% annual exceedance probability storm as the commander previously mentioned. These technical updates were captured in the 2020 engineering documentation report. Through the validation study earlier this year, we conducted further analysis of the costs, economics, and environmental impacts. Ultimately, it was determined that the modifications proposed in the engineering documentation report simply could not be economically justified. Rather than completely terminating the study and understanding the need and the risks that this watershed has, the Army Corps of Engineers opened up a general re-evaluation study, which allows us to take a fresh look without the same constraints imposed by the previous study. Now, this leads us to where we are today in the beginning stages of our general re-evaluation study. 
We now have the opportunity to find a cost effective project that maximizes benefits to the community and the economy. Your continued participation and mere presence here will help this study and our project team gather the critical information that we need to make the study a success. Thank you. Next slide. Great. Thanks, Cindy. Um, so, again, my name is Eric Merriman. I'm the study lead for this study. And so, um, Cindy just mentioned, uh, you know, this general, re general reevaluation report. So, what are the objectives of this study? Um, you know, we're early in, um, we're in the early stages of this study. So, we've identified three main objectives at this point that, that we'll go over today. And it's important to keep these in mind as we continue today's discussion. Um, because as we talk about how we develop plans, you know, these objectives will be how we develop plans. We'll be developing plans to meet these objectives. And so the first objective is to reduce risks to life and safety. Cindy mentioned 200,000 residents in the watershed as well as many visitors. Uh, the second objective is to reduce economic damages to structures and infrastructure. And the third is to reduce economic impacts to commerce and tourism. And these tie directly back to Cindy's introductory slide as, as to why are we here. Um, a few things to note about these objectives. Um, first off is that all of these three objectives, uh, you know, address flooding, right? They, they address flood risk. And so this study was funded as a flood risk management study. And flood risk management as defined by the Army Corps of Engineers is riverine flooding. Um, it's also important to note that, you know, riverine flooding is, is affected by coastal and tidal influences. And so we will be able to address those um, influences along the coast to the extent that they alter and affect riverine flooding. Um, another, another thing to note about these objectives is they do not necessarily include any specific environmental um, related objectives. And so we'll talk a little bit more about this as we move through this presentation this evening or this afternoon. Um, but this study is, is a flood risk management study. The Army Corps of Engineers also has authority to allow us to look at ecosystem restoration, which this study is not. So although we cannot, you know, have objectives with the specific purpose of, you know, bolstering or boosting the economic or the um, environmental conditions within the watershed, what we can do is include natural and nature-based measures that both reduce flood risk and benefit the environment. And so that's an important distinction to make, and it might be why you don't see any environmental objectives here, and we'll be discussing this again as we move forward. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, the goal of this study will be to identify a plan that reduces flood risks and meets these, meets these objectives. And so I want to spend the next slide to, to kind of go over pretty specifically the Army Corps of Engineers planning process and how we will um, move forward in developing that plan. Uh, next slide, Tyson. So this is the Army Corps of Engineers planning process in a nutshell. And I know there's a lot on the slide, so I'll just kind of step through it. Um, it goes through a series of steps in the planning process from left to right. So the first step um, is what we call the scoping phase. And it's really where we identify the problems and opportunities. Um, this is the phase that we are at in the study right now, and that's why we're seeking your engagement right now. We, we want you as a public and as various stakeholders throughout the watershed to help us identify those problems and opportunities as you've seen them and as you've experienced them throughout the watershed. Um, in addition to these public meetings, there's a lot of information that, that we already have, right? As, as Cindy mentioned earlier, this is not the first time that this has been studied, right? Um, there have been public meetings. There's been a lot of public input in previous, previous phases. So all of that information we have, and we are incorporating into this study. Um, that's, that's one comment that was raised on, on Wednesday's call, um, you know, the fact that there has been a lot of public input and a lot of public feedback, and it feels like we're starting over. We are starting over, um, but it's important to kind of keep in mind that we do have those previous constraints taken off of this study. So it's also important to start over again, right, because all of those constraints are now gone. Well, a lot of those constraints, like the 100-year flood constraint that was imposed on the previous studies is, is gone. So it's important to kind of take the feedback that we received in the last round, but also gain new feedback now. Um, in addition to those things, uh, reviewing existing information in public meetings, we'll also be conducting site, site visits and getting our feet on the ground and, and seeing the watershed in, in, in that way as well. So the second step in, this, in the planning process is to inventory and forecast conditions. So this is where we leverage a lot of the technical tools. So I mentioned previous um, studies have, have provided a lot of information that we can use, and one of those pieces of information and data are existing models, right? So the, the last round of this study developed a, a, an updated hydrologic and hydraulic modeling system that we are able to leverage in the current study. So we're not starting from scratch there either. In addition to hydrologic and hydraulic models, um, that, that essentially, those models essentially predict the volume of water and the flooding extent, right? So they, they tell us how bad the flooding is. And then we develop other models called economic models that translate that flood risk into economic damages 
as well as life safety risks. So we have models that can allow us to kind of capture you know, how that flooding impacts life safety throughout the watershed. In addition to those um, economic and hydraulic models, we're also going to be looking at environmental conditions. Again, a lot of information in the previous study, a lot of feedback from previous iterations of these studies that we'll be taking into consideration as well. And one thing I want to note here is that we, we look at these conditions both currently, so how they are now, as well as in the future. So our planning process mandates that we take things like climate change and sea level rise into consideration when we're formulating these plans um, to address flood risk in the watershed. So after we inventory and forecast conditions, the, first, the third phase of the planning process is to develop alternative plans. Um, so what we first do is we identify a series of what I'm going to call management measures right now, but essentially they're just features throughout the watershed that can help us reduce flood risk. I, I have a series of slides later on that kind of details what those management measures or features can be, and so I'll kind of hold that discussion until then. But essentially features throughout the watershed that reduce flood, flood risk at, at specific areas. And then we combine all of those features and the plans for the entire watershed that work holistically together with one another to reduce flood risk. And then finally, what we do is we evaluate and compare those alternatives. So we have a number of those alternative plans that we have developed, um, and then we compare them. We look at, you know, benefits to the economy that they have, so, you know, reduction in flood damages to structures, um, reductions in life risk, you know, how they might influence the environment, either negatively or positively, right? And so we take that into consideration as well. And then ultimately, all this information goes into um, – selecting a plan. And, and it's important that when we talk about selecting a plan, historically, the Army Corps of Engineers for the Flood Risk Management Studies um, selects a plan that we call the NED plan, or the National Economic Development Plan. And this is the plan that essentially provides the greatest economic benefit for the cost, so the greatest, you know, difference between cost and benefit. So that is generally the, the NED, or the National Economic Development Plan. And so historically, that's the plan that's been selected. We do have a little bit more lateral or latitude now to incorporate other aspects into that selection, things like the environment and life safety. Um, but again, it's important to note that, you know, generally speaking, it's the National Economic Development Plan that gets moved forward. Um, I'll, you know, I'll say generally speaking right now for the purpose of the slide. So the other thing I want to note here is, um, you know, public input is critical to this process, right? That's why we're having these meetings now early. We want to get your in input and feedback on opportunities and problems, as well as we're going to be talking about potential um, features throughout the watershed tonight as well. Um, it's also important to note that although, you know, public input and ideas are critical to the process, um, the study process may result in a plan that doesn't incorporate a lot of that input or feedback or might not be perfectly aligned with that input and feedback. And, it's, you know, that's okay. It's not that we're not listening. It's just that the process kind of, you know, goes the way the process goes, and, you know, ultimately we will select a plan uh, based off of the process. So, so next slide, please, Tyson. So I know there's a lot of information on this slide as well, and, again, these slides are going to be posted to the website. Um, but the, the point of this slide is, is, you know, how can you engage in the process, right? So the last slide kind of took us through the study scoping blue arrow at the top and the alternatives evaluation and analysis. Um, so we'll talk about public engagement kind of in that, in that series of um, processes right now. So you can see that we are here in the study scoping phases I mentioned where we're trying to identify problems and opportunities. Um, you know, we're reintroducing the study and gaining your, your initial input. Um, all of that information is going to go into um, the study process and we're going to be developing, taking all those management measures that we talked about tonight, um, we're going to be developing our own management measures to kind of address the problems and, and realize the opportunities that we discussed tonight. And then ultimately we'll have a, a focused array of alternatives. So we'll have the number of alternatives that we'll be comparing. And at that point, we're going to reach back out to the community. We haven't selected a plan yet. We don't have a draft report. Essentially, we've, we've done some screening of management measures, and we've, we've developed that into a um, you know, series of plans. And we want to get your input on you know, what was screened and why, um, gain any feedback there, as well as how the remaining items were combined into those plans. And we want to get your feedback there to see if we're missing anything or if there are any secondary effects that maybe we haven't considered yet. So after that point, um, we will develop a draft report, and then after we develop the draft report, that draft report will again go out for public review, and that will be your third, I guess, official public engagement, you know, forum like this meeting tonight. And so you'll, you'll be able to provide formal comments on the draft report at that point. Um, once all that input and, and feedback has been incorporated into the plan and into the report, um, we'll do a little bit more analysis on the selected plan. Um, we, you know, we'll, we'll kind of dive into it a little bit more, reduce some of the uncertainty, um, develop the plan a little bit further, 
ultimately kind of, and that will translate into a final report. And at that point, prior to the release of the final report, um, we'll, have a, we'll have a fourth public engagement where we provide information on the recommended plan um, to you to gain any feedback and, and, and discuss that plan at that point. And then finally, we'll have a sign sheets report. Um, it's also important to know that, so I, I've kind of outlined four formal public engagements like tonight, right? We, we will also, as a, you know, the team will also have email available to, for you to submit comments, um, as well as we have the website, which will have a, a comment feature in it as well. And so you'll be able to provide comments. Um, and, and we also want to note that um, in addition to these meetings and the website and the email, we, you know, we did get a lot of feedback, as Tyson mentioned in the last meeting, um, for some additional checkpoints with the public. And so we're going to, we're thinking about additional opportunities for stakeholder involvement throughout the process. And we'll be kind of announcing that um, as we move forward in the coming weeks. And so that's something that, that the study team heard and is actively trying to address and incorporate into, into what we're doing right now. Um, so next slide, please. So that's the public engagement process. And again, we're here tonight in the scoping phase to get your initial round of input and feedback. Um, and, and so tonight we really want to talk about problems and opportunities first. And so I want to spend some time to define what those are and exactly what it is we're asking for. So the definition of a problem is essentially an undesirable condition, right, that we can address through this study. And we have a really unique opportunity tonight to use a, a pretty awesome piece of technology called Crowdsource Reporter, where we can go in on a map and explicitly point at a location. We can talk about the nature, the cause, the location, the dimensions, the origin of, of the flood problems that you're seeing. And so really tonight we want to get very specific with the problems that you are experiencing within the watershed. Um, you know, the problems that we're talking about, generally speaking, for these flood risk management studies are, are one, elevated risk to life and safety, right? There's a lot of, this is a densely populated watershed. There are a lot of communities that might experience flooding. Um, you know, have you experienced these types of problems? If so, tell us where they are and what they are. Um, limited warning and evacuation is another problem that can, that can reduce life safety. Um, exposure to contaminated floodwaters, inundation of critical facilities. So if there are critical facilities that you know about that you live near or that you work at, um, that, that have it, that are impacted through flooding, um, through flooding, please tell us. As well as impact of transportation infrastructure, so that can affect evacuation or even access, um, you know, by emergency services. And the second type of problems are economic damages. So ha has your home been damaged, or maybe where you work been damaged? Um, you know, disruption of commerce and tourism, all these things that Cindy kind of had talked about before. Uh, so next, next slide, please, please. So opportunities, um, the definition of an opportunity is a desirable future condition that we can realize through the study. So it's, it can be the opposite of a problem, right? So, you know, one of the problems was reduced life safety um, or increased life safety risk. And so, you know, an opportunity is to reduce that life safety risk. Um, they can also be completely separate from the problems that we identify. And, and here's a great, you know, again, point to kind of point out the opportunities to improve ecological conditions. So, you know, we have an opportunity to improve the ecosystem through application of measures that can, you know, not only reduce flood risk, but also benefit the environment. And so, so that's an opportunity that we can realize through this study. Um, protect and preserve historical and cultural sites, um, enhance recreational opportunities, excuse me, um, as, as well as identification of climate resiliency practices that we can incorporate in other areas. Um, you know, I, I want to note that, you know, these problems and opportunities are just examples to get your thought you know, to get your thought process going, right? We, we are asking you to help us expand on these and help us get more specific, specific with each of these as well. Um, so Tyson, next slide, please. So after we talk about problems and opportunities, the second um, breakout session is gonna be, I'm asking you to help us what I'm gonna call build a solution. But essentially what we're asking you to do is to identify features or actions on the landscape that can help us, uh, you know, address those problems or realize those opportunities. Uh, and there's a number of types of, of features that we can implement. And so the first type of feature that I'm going to discuss tonight is natural and nature-based features. So these are features, um, you know, they're either natural features or features that, that we create to mimic or work with natural conditions to reduce flood risk. And so, you know, one example is restoring natural floodplains or terraces. And there's a picture of the Lodi Kahlo there on the, on the right is an, is an example of that. Um, native planting. You know, I, I know that there's a, a discussion in the chat earlier about removal of, of non-native albizia trees, right? I know that albizia trees can uproot easily and cause debris, which causes flooding, right? And so, 
So native planting is, is an opportunity to, to implement a natural nature-based feature. As well as green infrastructure, we had a great conversation in the last meeting in my, in my breakout group about things like bioswales or rain gardens. Um, you know, these types of features that mimic natural processes um, to help us kind of restore or reduce flood risk. So, uh, next slide, please, Tyson. So, the second type of feature that we can implement and we'll discuss this evening is non-structural measures. And so, these are, these are features that we can, we can apply on the landscape that reduce or avoid flood damages by changing the use of the floodplain or accommodate, accommodating uses to the flood hazard. And so, Essentially, a great example of this is, is elevation of homes. So you can, you know, put homes on stilts or elevate homes so the first floor is outside or above the flood elevation. Um, you can also floodproof homes. You can put a floodproof membrane and floodproof doors to prevent waters from entering the building. Or you can just elevate, you know, if it's a garage, you can elevate everything in the garage to, to prevent damages. That's an example of wet floodproofing. You can acquire and relocate homes from the floodplain, as well as improve flood warning or preparedness throughout the watershed. And the third and final um, types of solutions that we'll talk about tonight and ask you to kind of help us identify are structural solutions. And these are, these are solutions or features that reduce or avoid flood damages by modifying the flood hazard. So essentially you're changing the way the flood, um, you know, impacts the area. And so these are things like channel modification. Can we increase capacity of the channel? Um, we can create a diversion channel or a bypass channel or tunnel um, to, to route water around specific areas. Um, other uh, ideas that have been raised in previous iterations of the study are things like a second canal outlet, um, flood walls along the canal, detention or storage upstream or in existing green space, like parks throughout the watershed. It's a great opportunity there. Um, and then floodgates and pumps. And again, these are only examples, and we want your help to expand this list, right? These are just examples of things that have been discussed in the past. We want to, you know, understand there's been a lot of input in the past, but again, I kind of want to re-highlight that the conditions have changed at this point. So, you know, although there's been great input in the past, um, now we know we're not constrained to that 100 year flood. And so maybe there are other ideas that folks can come up with and, you know, some additional time have, have raised additional ideas in the process. And so again, we're here to kind of start over tonight and I'll take all the feedback that we've received through previous iterations and gain new feedback and input at this point. Um, and so with that, I'll stop talking. And I, you know, on the last call, somebody mentioned that I, I was lecturing and I used to give lectures and I don't feel like I'm lecturing, but I feel like this is all important information to arm you with to facilitate tonight's discussion. And so I appreciate everybody's time and looking forward to the next step of this. Over. Thanks, Eric. Uh, not so bad as far as lecturing goes. Okay, so we're going to uh, move into our breakout exercises now. Now, obviously, we don't have as large a group as we had on Wednesday. Um, so this will be a little more of an intimate affair. And I think we don't need all six breakout groups. If we got 46 folks, um, I'm going to uh, uh, I'm going to uh, put us into four groups instead of six. I think that's sufficient. Um, so uh, I just want to remind you, you know, uh, as we go into these groups and we work on crowdsource reporter and have our small group discussions, um, keep your audio on mute unless you're speaking. Now, do be conscious of acronyms and technical language, although I think this is a remarkably savvy uh, group of stakeholders who, who know a lot of that, um, but um, maybe some folks don't. Uh, and, and be mindful of, of your colleagues and just ensure that, you know, everybody has uh, a chance um, to speak. So, okay, well, let's, um, last time there were some folks that didn't get put into breakout rooms. And I think it may have been related to the number of people. I'm not sure. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and try to put everybody into four rooms. Now, I do see some phone numbers. Um, if you're on the phone only, you'll stay in the main room. Um, and that's okay. We'll just operate the main room as if it's another breakout. Uh, and we can facilitate that discussion. Um, I'm going to go ahead and... There we go. We've got four breakout sessions. And, um, all right, I'm just uh, making sure that the settings are correct. All right, it looks fine. Okay, here we go. Um, this will be 30 minutes. I think that's more than enough time. And I'll send out a warning uh, before we close. Ready, set. All right.
Okay, so it looks like a few of us are still in the main room. That's fine. We have some phone numbers. Um, if you uh, can, I, you may be able to assign yourself to a breakout session if you would like to go to one. Um, in the participant um, panel, you should see at the top of there a main meeting button and then a breakout sessions button. And if you click breakout sessions, you should see a list and to the right a little join links. Um, and so you can click on those to, to join if you would like to do that. I think most of us can see that. Okay, and Vera Coscalo is our facilitator for the main room. Hey, Vera, good to see you. Um, so I'm going to leave it up to you, and I'm just going to kind of bounce around different, uh, different rooms and make sure everybody's doing all right. Right. Hey, Vera, That's good. This, Thank this, you, is this is Elliot Porter, too. I'm going to be in this room with you tonight. Great. Thanks for joining, Elliot. Um, before we get started uh, with the technical topic at hand, does anybody need some technical WebEx assistance um, to, to help with practice muting and unmuting, assigning yourself to a breakout group? Anybody need help? I'm also a fan source reporter. I totally forgot to show people how to use that. So let me go do that in the breakouts. Thanks. Okay. Great. Can everybody hear me okay? Hopefully you can hear me right. Um, I'm also watching the chat box. So if you're having trouble speaking, uh, feel free to reach out to me via chat. And I'm just going to give it another minute for anybody still with us in the main room. Um, if you need help moving yourself to a breakout group or with other technical stuff. Okay, if you need help, I will still be available to assist, but we are gonna move on. I will share my screen as I'm bringing up Crowdsource Reporter here. So let's see. Stay with me, folks. Okay. So, um, well, thank you for putting that in the chat there. Okay, so I see Tyson's included the, the link to the site in the chat. And, and it's also on the, the presentation. And so, let's see. Okay. Here, I just made you pre presenter if you want to present your screen. Great, thank you. Okay. All right. So, hopefully you guys can see this okay. I'm going to share the screen for a little bit and then I will get back to, to you folks that are just on the phone only and not on the web, but I used the website that uh, Tyson had put in the chat and where it welcomed the public comment tool, this tool allows the user to submit location-based comments. So instead of, um, you can have general comments as well that are about the watershed as a whole, but if you have a specific piece of information that you know because you live here, as I do, then it can be helpful to the, the project team to have those location-based comments. And it's a, another neat way to help save your comments and make sure they're incorporated into the, the planning process. So the application workflow, you click on your group member to the right, and we will be the other, and we will click, click to start a comment. We'll fill out the field. And um, when we click on the map to identify the location of the comment, we'll close it out with clicking report it. So let's practice that real quick as a, as a group and then we'll, we'll get some dialogue on the phone. So we are other, no other group member, uh, number, sorry. And we will pick a location. So we're click to start a comment. Okay, my, well, Actually, this would be a great opportunity for somebody on the phone. If you wanna, if you're not on the crowdsource reporter right now, 
um, and you want to make a comment over the phone, I can help uh, input it into the crowdsource reporter for you. So I know we've got some folks on the phone. Let's see here. Uh, we've got somebody whose uh, local number ends with one zero, somebody else with 08. Okay, I see somebody unmuted here, the one zero number. For the 08, I'll send you a request to unmute. Somebody 25 is unmuted. I see Terry Chan. So thanks, um, Tim Sakahara. And that is it for my, my group. So uh, does anybody have any comments? Oh, and the, the topic of our current breakout group is, um, is uh, sorry about that, is for um, problems. So at this point, we're talking about uh, things that you're observing regarding um, flood issues, like during a heavy rain type of thing. So does anybody have any comments at this point that we'll, we'll practice using crowdsource supported together? Okay. Uh, we'll 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 take another turn around uh, uh, around the group in a minute, but um, I can I can kind of kick things off and and do a demonstration one just of my my own, and then um, we will come back for more open discussion after that. So let's see. My name is. Hopefully you can see this. Okay. My name is Vera Costello. And my comment category, um, let's see. So we're at the problem portion and the other required field is what specifically is the problem. So let's think. Um, I know from personal experience that I sometimes see some flooding along um, Dole Street. Sometimes there's there's flooding on Dole Street when it rains. So let's see if flooding on Dole Street during rainstorms. And this is an optional portion, but the next comment uh, box is I'm interested in this project because, and from my perspective, um, I think I'm worried about safety. Um, as a resident in this watershed, I'm I'm worried about um, not just where my my home, but also getting around during times of flooding. So that could be another type of, of comment that um, folks like me might be interested in. So um, road safety during high rain, during a large rainstorm. Okay. And then I have the option to add my who I work for, so my title and organizational affiliation. I have the option to add my email and phone. In the interest of time, I'm going to just uh, skip ahead to click, and the next direction is click the map to um, to uh, find the location. So I'm going to zoom in to Dole Street here on the map. So same thing, like if you Google Google Maps. Um, then you'll be able to to see some of these locations. Um, okay, let's see. Okay, Dole Street, and okay, there's there's Metcalf, and so that is going to be my point. And now the last step is to click on Report It, and I get a little message at the end saying, "Thank you, the report has been submitted." So that's how it's done. It's as easy as that. I'm going to stop sharing so that I can focus on what everybody still in my main room has to say. Um, Elliot, thank you for, for joining me, uh, and I, I appreciate your support. I don't know if you're, you're checking um, some of the other chat, um, but uh, feel free to, to circle around if anybody else needs, 
be some help. I don't want to to uh, dominate your your assistance. So um, setting that aside, we've still got some folks on the phone that are unmuted. So please feel free to speak up and share some some problems that you're seeing during heavy rainstorm type situations. It looks like we just had uh, Richard Kawano join. Thank you for joining us, Richard. Uh, we've got Terry Chan, Tim Sakahara. This is also um, an opportunity where if you don't necessarily have a specific problem in mind, but um, you can share some questions and we can kind of skip ahead to some of the question and answer portion. You can do that either over the phone or in the chat. Um, and if it is, uh, if you want to mull it over a little bit and uh, respond at a later time, um, we also have the uh, main email that you can use to share some of this information. I'm going to put that in the chat now, but that's aloi, all one word, at honolulu.gov. Okay, and we've got the website for the crowdsource reporter, we've got the main email address. Um, let's see. We also have, uh, so somebody mentioned earlier in the chat and over the presentation that this presentation will be uploaded as well as uh, response to comments onto the main project webpage. And that is honolulu.gov slash aloi. Um, and then the public engagement is one of the tabs on the left-hand side. So I will also add that into the chat. It looks like there's some folks that have just joined us. Reporter. The website for Crowdsource Reporter. Great. Um, so it is on the slide that is being shown right now on the web. In the this web I'm meeting. on the phone. It is in. Oh, great. Yeah, yeah. Just uh, for 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 those folks that can see the web, and I'll, I'll get to the address in just a second. Um, so it's in. It's on the slide. It's in the chat, and the address is H. T T P S colon two slashes L R P dot maps dot arc A R C G I S all one word dot com slash apps A T T S slash crowdsource reporter so that's all one word crowdsource reporter slash index dot html should i should i pause there Did, are you are you getting it so far yes okay great i will keep going so we're at the dot html question mark a p p i d equals the equal sign d f 9 e uh, seven seven C F F six four five four nine four five A D three D C seven five seven one six the letter A zero four four E C. 
And if that was that was really long, so thank you for staying with me for that long. Um, and uh, that may be kind of a, a lot. And so you can, uh, what's a little easier to remember is honolulu.gov slash alawai. And there will be, I don't think there's a link right now, but there will be a link to the, the crowdsource recorder so that you can follow up um, and, and find the link there. Or you can also email uh, alawai at honolulu.gov and ask for um, the link to the crowdsource recorder. So those are other options other than that very long address. So thank you for your patience. Um, hey, hey Vera, yeah. this is Elliot. So while we Hi. don't have the link in the in the main body of the website right now, we do have a link to all of the slides on there that are associated with with these public meetings. Um, and, and so the link is within that. So I'm, I'm sorry that there's not a more straightforward way um, but that is another option for you to, to, to open the slides and to find the link from there. Um, that's also on the um, Honolulu.gov Alawai site under uh, public engagement. Awesome. Thank you, Elliot. Okay. So um, thank you for the query about the, uh, for the folks on the phone, getting the, the address uh, to the crowdsource reporter. Um, does anybody want to share any discussion about uh, problems related to flooding at this point? Or are you having technical issues? Yes? Okay. Um, does anybody have any, is anybody having any, uh, any technical issues that they need help with regarding crowdsource reporter? or have any um, other input at this point? Okay. Um, I see maybe a, a few new folks have joined. I'm requesting this is a great opportunity to have a, a dialogue while we're in the, these breakout groups. So I'm, I'm sending a little request to unmute. So for anybody that just joined us, uh, what we're doing at this point during our breakout groups is we're first gonna, we're, we're first um, round of, of discussions is about uh, some of the problems you're seeing. So whether that's um, flooding and structures in your neighborhood or in uh, a neighboring neighborhood, or um, like the comment I put into CrowdSource Reporter earlier, um, I live in the watershed and I've observed road flooding and sometimes I'm concerned about that impact on traffic safety, road safety. Um, mm -hmm. So I'd be interested to hear your thoughts uh, regarding problems or if you have um, some questions that you're curious about at this point, this would also be a great time to share some of those. Um, so as far as sharing, you can uh, discuss over the phone at this point or there's uh, the website, honolulu.gov slash alawai or you can always reach out via email to alawai at honolulu.gov. Uh, Vera, hi, hi. Yeah, Richard Kuwano, I was eating lunch, <laughs> lunch in a way. So yeah, I would like to join one of those breakout groups. Yeah, so you're in WebEx right now because I can see you. So already, uh, yes. that's a win. Um, if you go to the top of your screen, 
you should see right. several menu items. The okay. left hand side starts with file. And you that. keep going to the right. Uh -huh. Next is edit, then share, then view, audio, video, participant meeting, and then breakout sessions. Okay. And if you click I, on breakout sessions, about halfway down. Yeah, I don't see breakout session. After meeting, it says help. Uh, I'm having the uh -huh. same issue as Richard. Dang, yeah. okay. I'm not seeing a breakout session option. What if I click on meeting? Okay. Well, hold on. There's more options. That move to stage, lock a participant in his location, and chat. And similarly, okay. so I see breakout is, sessions are in pro. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. So, so you do see breakout sessions, Ian? Uh, yes, but it does say wait to be assigned. Ooh, okay. Hmm. Okay. Um, so I'm going to ask about how I can assign y'all. Yeah. So if I can move you to a breakout session. Um, but in the meantime, do you happen to see on the right hand side of your screen, it should say participants? Do y'all see uh, that? Yes, yet? I um, see you, that. You do see participants. Okay. Yeah. So under the participants, it should say right now mine says 43. And I have two choices. Mine either there's two buttons directly underneath that it says either main meeting or breakout sessions. Do y'all see that? And, and that's and that's where it says breakout sessions are starting. Wait to be assigned to a session to me. Yeah, that's what I see okay. also. And you're not, you're not okay. And you're not seeing um, a list of the sessions underneath, right? No, not all. Just a list of participants. Okay. Okay, let's see. So, um, so I actually think that, that that's okay. The, in the breakout sessions, they're having a similar conversation to us. So they're learning how to use the crowdsource reporter tool. Um, it's an opportunity to discuss with members of the project team, maybe some concerns or questions that you have. Um, and, and so Vera and I are, are, are more than able to, to kind of uh, respond to you and lead you through some of that stuff. Uh, but there are similar activities happening in the breakout session. So I, I just want to make sure that you don't feel that you're you're being left out of specific discussions. Uh, we're all kind of speaking generally about problems right now, uh, trying to learn and apply the crowdsource reporter tool um, and capture comments and feedback in the chat that we can incorporate into the study as we move along. So uh, if you have any any thoughts um, that you'd like to share, any uh, problems that you've identified, um, or, or any things that you'd like to discuss, um, I think it would be appropriate for us to go ahead and, and, and do that uh, here, e even though you can't be assigned to one of the specific breakout groups. Okay, you know, I, I got to make a quick phone call. I'll be right back. And, and I do have a concern. Just uh, give me one moment. I'm going to turn my camera on. Sorry about that. I was um, planning to just listen in to see the, hear the current updates and community concerns. Um, however, oh, hey, I'm being assigned to a breakout session now. Should I just join that? Go for it. Sure, go for it. Okay, I'm going to join. Hey, Richard, did you have a chance to finish your phone call? Okay, am I am I okay now? We can hear you. Yep. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I really don't have too much to offer. I was just, you know, checking in to see what the discussion was. I so kind of know this is the first part of the meeting. 
Yeah, so no worries. The um, So if you go to honolulu.gov slash alawai, um, on the webpage, there, there is, uh, you're able to upload the, the present, I'm sorry, to download the, the presentation that we went through um, earlier in the meeting. And okay. within the presentation, uh, Elliot made a great point that there is a link to the crowdsource reporter. So um, what we're doing during this breakout group uh, is to have a discussion about problems that folks are seeing in terms of flooding um, in your own home, where you go for other parts of your life within the watershed, and to help inform the project team about uh, concerns that should be addressed as part of the project. So I went through the, how, what it's like to put a comment into crowdsource supporter, uh, reflecting that in my case, I, I live in the watershed and I've seen some road flooding. And so my concern is for vehicular traffic type safety um, during rainstorms. I do have a couple questions, you know, like I, I'm hearing about this huge oh. pumping station. Or is any of you folks have any information on that? Is that like these multi-story huge pumping stations, which doesn't seem to make a lot of sense nope. to me. You know, they're going to be they'll be there near the beach, exposed to any flooding itself, and uh, the energy. You know, say if there is something bad happens and the electrical system goes out, I suppose they could have some kind of uh, you know backup electrical generation system, but it all seems like not a very good idea. Thank you, Richard. Yeah, what I, what I hear you saying is regarding um, some of the solutions that were investigated during the last go round, that you're concerned about some of the drawbacks from like a large pumping station. So whether it would be impacted by a big storm, uh, some of the aesthetic impacts, how is it gonna be ugly? Uh, what is the energy use going to be on the regular? So is that being investigated? And I, the, the short response is yes. So that is being looked into as an option, as well as for each of the options that are being considered, what are the, the benefits and the drawbacks? So absolutely. Yeah, great question. Thanks. Anything else while we can still, while we can still see and hear you? Yeah, and it seems like, you know, the initial phase where I think we're going back a few years now seems to have had a significant impact on the plans here. So the Corps of Engineers is pretty much, well, I don't know about going back to square one, but they, you know, initially they said, this is the plan, you know, we've studied it. We think it's a good idea, but now because of public input, uh, a lot of that seems to have changed or has changed. That's the, so what I, what I hear you saying, Richard, is wh how did we get to where we are today and what's different about this new, new round of public engagement and project review? So um, I would say in a very small nutshell that uh, one of the key things is um, that in, instead of only looking Okay, and we're, we're about to close on our breakout session, so this might be one of our, our last discussion points, and then we'll join the rest of the group. Okay. But um, one of the, the key items is that in the last round of looking into resolving, um, managing flood risk in the LOI watershed, uh, the focus was solely on the 1% chance that the 100 year storm, so massive storm, possible to hit. Um, in theory, only once every hundred years, but in actuality, with especially with climate change, a higher risk than that and, and catastrophic. So one of the key differences is with this go round, we're considering um, smaller, but still damaging storms. So that's 10, 25, 50 year storms that still have a huge impact on residents like us in the watershed. Um, to, to to still have an opportunity to, to make a difference in our lives and to and, to, and he's capturing it. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. All right, welcome back, you guys. I know it's a little weird the way that WebEx works. So like in mid sentence, you're you, you're back in the main room, um, but that's all right. Um, 
I have to apologize. I, I missed something fairly fundamental here, which I was supposed to show you how to use CrowdSource Reporter before we went to the breakouts. Second technical issue that came up uh, is for some reason our facilitators were not able to present or share their screen. I'm not sure why that's happening. I think that I can overcome it by assigning you guys presenter privileges manually. So I will do that by going into each breakout room and doing that for you uh, facilitator folks. Hopefully that works. Uh, if not, you know, obviously you, you've been making do. Um, so let me go ahead um, before we uh, go into our next group, before we start talking about that, um, and show you how to use this tool. Okay, so um, I'm going to, all right. Share. Uh, this is okay. I need to. There we go. Sorry about this. Forgot to take back presenter rights myself. Okay, there we are. I'm going to share content and share Google Chrome. Okay. So. I am, I forget which group I'm in here. Um, so if we go, let's go to home. If you put um, the link into your browser, you will see this with, a, there'll be a splash page um, with some instructions. Over on the left here, you can zoom in and out. Uh, you can find your own location. And then we have some legends down here. On the right, we've got our group numbers. Obviously, today we've just got four groups. Um, and uh, as has been mentioned a couple of times, this tool will be live for another 30 days until de December 12th, specifically. Um, so if you don't, uh, you know, if you, we're not going to have time to put everything in today, obviously. So, but you've got a lot of time in the next month to think about things. Um, and you can go in here and you see these points where people have. Um, you can zoom in, you can use your mouth, mouse to scroll in and zoom, and you can click on a point, and you can see that someone has put a comment in here. Comment category, potential solution, uh, implement permeable pavement in this location. So if you would like to leave a similar comment, um, you first need to click on the group, then click on click to start a comment. And then you have this little form. You can put your name. Um, you put the category. Are you talking about a problem or an opportunity or a potential solution? Uh, describe what that is here. And then there's some optional fields if you just want to tell us a little bit more about yourself. Um, and then eventually, so I'm going to just put um, to show you Tyson comment, uh, potential solution, yeah, permeable pavement. That sounded good. And um, so the, the key point here is you actually have to select a point on the map for it to take. So if you have a general comment that doesn't apply to a very specific location, that's fine. You know, you, you, uh, you can just go up to the top of the map to the Colo Mountains and just put something in there or, you know, something like that. Um, that, that works too. Um, but you need to put a, a comment, so I'm just going to put mine here. And then you need to click Report It down here. And once you've done that, your comment is in there. Okay, and as uh, I, I showed when I clicked on this one, um, you can see, oops, now I'm back out of there. When I clicked on this one before, you can see that the optional fields that have like email and stuff like that are not shown to other people. So that'll remain hidden. Okay, so that's how you use this tool. Uh, and again, I don't expect us to be doing tons of stuff and inputting everything in this today, um, but it's very important that we show this to you and that you play with it, figure out how to use it because it's gonna be one of the main ways that we receive input 
um, particularly any input that you want to give that pertains to a, a specific location. Um, in addition to this, of course, we do have the email, um, alawai at honolulu.gov um, as well. So, um, all right, so I think that's, I will stop sharing that. We're back to here. Now we're going to move uh, uh, Excuse towards... me, but the dots are not showing up on the actual um, public comment tool. And so I don't know how um, how it can proceed if, if the dots don't show up or how we can put our own dots in, please. So you should be able to, um, and thank you for, for, for mentioning this, Laura. Um, I, I think if you uh, first, so you've clicked on the group, right? Okay, so you're in a group. Um, before you, there may be a group where there, there aren't any dots for you to view, um, but you can add a dot if you first click the comment, the red button in the upper right, and then you have to fill in the form. There's a couple required fields specifically. Fill those in, then put your point on the map, and you'll see a little black circle. And then once you've put your point on the map, then you click the reported button, which is the blue one on the lower right, and then it will submit everything. Um, but again, worst case scenario, if it's just not working for you, send us an email. Um, and, and, you know, yeah, certainly you can send me an email as well and let me know if it's not working and, and I can work with you, uh, you know, individually to, to figure that out. Okay, so let's go to our next, uh, our next breakout, which is building a solution. Um, and so again, I'll go into these groups and I'll, I'll make our facilitators presenters. Um, a reminder that we have three main sort of buckets, types of solutions, natural and nature-based, uh, structural, which affects the floodwaters themselves, stops them, slows them, redirects them, um, or non-structural, which gets things out of the way, or otherwise reduces damages without directly altering the floodwaters. Um, and then before we go into this group, um, there, were, there have been a number of questions about sort of what the optimum solution is um, that has been mentioned. Um, and so I want to give Jeff uh, a chance to, to elaborate that a little bit on that um, before we go to the breakout. Thank you, Tyson. Aloha, Kako. Uh, I know many of you from previous efforts, but uh, my name is Jeff Herzog, and I'm the Deputy Chief for Civil and Public Works. Uh, so if you don't see me actively involved, as actively involved, um, Cindy Akpal, um, is who's worked with me for the past two years, is, is really helping to lead this team, um, as well as Eric Miriam. So if you don't see me, don't think I've abandoned you. I'm still actively involved. Um, but, um, yeah, so Tyson and, and the city and county has, has has posed the question, and it's a very good question, well, what is that optimum solution? And so that's a very good question, and there's lots of contributing factors to answering that question. Um, but in the end, I want to put this up front. Whatever we recommend, we recommend in partnership with the city and county of Honolulu. So Mayor Blangiardi, Director Kozloff, um, Director Gonzer, uh, facilities maintenance, if they don't like the project, we can't recommend it because we can't um, pursue anything unilaterally. And so that optimum project is going to be um, based off of scientific and engineering data, as well as environmental impact analysis, as well as economic impact analysis, as well as ground truthing and validating a lot of the, that information with the community and with key stakeholders. And so we will evaluate um, everything from that 1% low probability but catastrophic event all the way down to that two-year, 99% chance of occurrence, it's going to happen. And, and then between there, we will have to identify what is um, the level of risk reduction that um, satisfies the economic justification, but is also uh, acceptable to not only the, the city and county, but also to the resource agencies and the environmental impacts. So um, we are not 
we are no longer constrained as we previously were to that 1% 100 year event that is low probability but catastrophic. Now we will look at that full range and we will look at a full range of recommendations from nature natural based solutions to um, yes, in some places we may look at uh, flood walls, other places we may look at detention and debris basins. Um, but some of those concerns and some of the considerations that we have to take in uh, in, in part uh, is real estate impacts, um, space availability, um, uh, uh, cost, uh, pro prohib cost prohibitive features. And so all of those planning considerations we, we will take into account. Um, and, and ultimately between now and September of 2022, um, when we are, are uh, scheduled to make our next recommendation for, for the plan that we want to see move forward to the to the public release and to the environmental resource agency release over the next nine months that's what our focus is going to be on we don't have any of the answers yet and so um, the questions about um, well we want to see the economic analysis of all these the different ranges so do we and it's something that we need to see we want to uh, folks asking about uh, reforestation it's something that we need to look into. Um, the Kalia Gate uh, recommendation at the mouth of the canal. Again, for different flood events, we need to look into that. The second opening to the canal, we need to look into that. And so those are things that we captured previously, but we weren't really able to fit within the authorization. And now we have that opportunity to go back and find that optimum level. Now, again, to reiterate, we're in partnership with the city and county of Honolulu. So your continued participation is necessary and your continued participation and communication with your leadership through the neighborhood boards and the city and county administration is the key to your voice being heard in order for us to be able to identify a project that maybe not everybody is going to like, but at least everybody can understand the purpose and understand the environmental and community impacts so that we can reduce that risk to the ROI watershed. Back to you, Tyson. Thanks so much, Jeff. Well said. Okay, and that's actually a perfect introduction to discussing uh, potential solutions. Um, so I'm gonna, here we go, we got we're gonna paste back into the chat. So we got the link there to Crowdsource Reporter. Um, I'm gonna break us up again into our, our sessions. It will be another 30 minute session. Um, and uh, I'm going to go in to each one and assign presenter rights to each of the facilitators. So hopefully that will work for you guys, um, but we'll make do if not. Um, okay, so we've got four sessions. All right, here we go. And they are filling up as we speak. For some reason, it takes a while for everyone to get assigned. Okay. Vera, you have presenter rights. Uh, I will give those to you very soon. Hold on a sec. There you are. Okay, hopefully you can present now. Great, thank you, Tyson. Yep. Hey, so before we kick off, uh, it looks like uh, we might have a few new people joining the meeting. So to catch y'all up, what we've been up to so far, we had a presentation about the project overall, the need for the project, and kind of where we are now, which in and how that's differed from before. So rather than have me get the presentation all over again, um, there is a link to it on the project website. And I know that there's, um, if you just Google Alawai, there's a, a few different things out there, but the, the most up-to-date, cutting edge, correct website for this iteration of the project is, and I'm gonna put it in the chat, 
slash LOI. I'm going to go back to the main page. Um, and uh, so if you're looking for the presentation that uh, was presented at the beginning of this meeting, uh, that is on that site and it includes a link to the crowdsource reporter. Um, and so the role of the crowdsource reporter, it's another way to share your input about problems you're seeing like backed up streams or flooding you've experienced at your property or like in the, my case, I'm, I, I live in the watershed and I've seen some uh, intersections that are flooded and I'm concerned about um, traffic safety type risks. So let me, before we keep going, send out in the chat the reminder of the website, honolulu.gov slash ROI. Um, if this is a convenient way to share your input during this web meeting, that's great. If you wanna mull it over and share it a little later, there's also the um, email address for the project, and that is alloy at punalugu.gov. And I am also sharing that in the chat. Okay, so we've talked about the website with the presentation. We've talked about the main email address. You can also share things in the chat if uh, verbalizing during our meeting is not your, your, your preference. You can always share in the chat um, or send via email. And there's also a crowdsource reporter. So CloudSource Reporter is like putting your comment in the chat, but being able to attach it to a point in a map that the project team will be able to see later. So you can either do that during this meeting right at this very moment, or the site will remain up for another 30 days. So uh, most of the folks remaining in my group, somebody's got a, somebody's got a hot mic here. Uh, I'm going to, I think it might be, my friend here, so I'm gonna to ask to mute just until you're ready to, to share your input. But for those folks that are on the phone right now, uh, don't let that stop you. You can come back and share um, via email or in CrowdSource Reporter a little later. But um, let's, get a, let's get a conversation going right now. So during the last round of breakout groups, we were talking more about some of the problems that folks see. And this round of breakout groups was to discuss some solutions. So that can be some of the solutions that were brought up last time around. Um, Richard had brought up the, the pumping station and whether, uh, like how is the core considering pros and cons of that and some of the other solutions. And also folks have a new solution that is, because we, we may have some new stakeholders that um, either weren't involved or weren't around at the time of the last uh, round of this project. We wanna hear from you as well. So let's get, started with some solutions. Okay, I'm gonna go through the folks still in my room and uh, ask you to unmute yourselves. Um, and I'm, I know that something that was mentioned before, the main body of the, this meeting is being recorded, but these breakout sessions are not, but never fear because I am taking notes. So if you wanna just share over the phone, that is still a-okay. So I'm gonna request that everybody who is muted, feel free to unmute and share your thoughts on solutions. Hello, this is Richard Awano. Hey, Richard. Hi, yeah, so, you know, I, I've attended quite a few of these meetings going back at least two years now. And um, yeah, my impression that the community input, as important as it was, but maybe it, maybe it was a good thing because they have, you know, initially I did support the, the, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers project. I generally supported it and thinking that we can't wait, we have to do something. I'm going back, what, 10 years when we had that big flood in Moilili, you know, the uh, Hamilton Library damage, the flooding down that McCulley stream, and that was that 40 days of rain period. And I'm thinking that it's gonna happen again and it's probably gonna be worse in the future. 
So at some point we've got to, you know, make a decision and move forward and understanding it's not going to be a perfect solution. It may even be the wrong solution. Uh, but, you know, with, with some good planning and, and input that it will mitigate future damage. Thank you, Richard. Yeah, that's that's a really important perspective that this is not um, this is intended to benefit the residents of this watershed. And this is not um, like Jeff had mentioned earlier, the Corps is not making any unilateral decisions. This is all based off of public input filtered through the local sponsor, who is the, the city and county of Honolulu through our mayor. So, yes, thank you. Great point about solutions. Um, for, for those folks that are just joining us, uh, we're currently in a breakout group discussing some options for solutions. Um, if verbal input is not your thing, feel free to share via uh, email. So the email address is allaway at honolulu.gov. Uh, if you're on the web uh, meeting, you can feel free to share with us via chat in the right hand chat area. Um, and we also have the option to share via CrowdSource Reporter. So that's like sharing via chat, except you can put a pin in a map online and that information goes to the planning team. So when it comes to solutions, um, one uh, key point that was brought up a little earlier in today's meeting is uh, there, there are some folks that have the opinion or feel like the, the core has the reputation of um, the agency of concrete, that it's a, a core project and let's build up big. And um, the project managers wanted to share that that is, that, 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 that the core's perspective is a lot bigger than that. It's, yes, there are some projects that would be structural, but it's also important to consider natural and nature-based type structures, as well as non-structural options for solutions. So with that in mind, um, if folks have thoughts on some of the solutions that might be new, we wanna hear your, your thoughts on new stuff, as well as thoughts on other um, solutions that have been brought up in, uh, in the last round, either on this past Wednesday or um, from the 2019 public meeting. Um, yeah, let's hear from you. Hey, hey Vera, this is Elliot. I, I just wanted to add more thing, one more thing to to Richard's earlier comment. Um, and, and I, you know, I very much take your your point that at, at a certain point we need to stop studying and we need to start implementing. I, I would say that um, we feel that this opportunity in the general reevaluation report is a really excellent opportunity to do that. So, you know, where they were, the previous studies were restricted to that 100 year event where they had to find really big solutions to kind of contain all of that water. Um, when you say, you know, maybe not um, the, the comprehensive, maybe not the solution that solves all of the problems, but a solution that's implemented and starts to provide benefits. We feel that that is really what this study allows us to do. Um, and, and so, you know, maybe we don't get to the 100 year, but if you implement, you know, a, a project that provides protection, maybe at a 25 year level of flooding, um, that's great benefit to the community as well. So we're hopeful uh, that with the increased flexibility to find something that is optimal um, and economically justified, um, that, that we can find solutions to move forward with and start implementing in the community. So I, I really appreciate the comment. And I just want you to know that the, the study team very much has that in mind. Hello, I've got a possible solution. Uh, my name is Amy Brown, and I was thinking that to put a wall up between the Alawai Canal and Waikiki is uh, not the safest route to go because walls always need one maintenance and two, they can crumble like they did in uh, New Orleans. So I'm thinking at the end of the Alawai entering into the Waikiki Yacht Club, you could create a dam allowing the water to go out into the ocean, but not into the alloy. And that if there's any extra runoff or drainage when storms come, that you can divert it using pipes uh, to almost, you know, anywhere on the 
south side or west side of the island where they need more water. And I'm wondering if that solution, which would actually be cheaper and guaranteed, unlike walls, has been considered. Thanks, Amy. Uh, thank you for sharing. And I want to make sure I understand the location that you're talking about. So I'm zooming in on my map here. And you said, sorry, so you were talking about the golf club? No, the LOI empties into the ocean. So by the uh -huh. Key Yacht Club, right? Yeah. So while you need okay. to do, you've already got the land mass and, a, and an opening created naturally. And all you need to do is build a dam-like structure where the water exits, but can't come back in. And therefore, any rise in ocean level will not affect the alloy or the water behind it. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, so what I hear you saying is some sort of a one way, a unidirectional something. I, I've heard of uh, some features called like a duck valve type outfall. So it can, with the materials behind it, it can open to let stuff out, but then nothing is getting back in. So that would be an option or some sort of dam, but the idea being to let water out, but not allow it to come back in, in the, in like a circumstance, um, Somebody mentioned earlier about hurricanes, so where you're getting uh, rainfall, smoke, but also having storm surge, and so you don't want to add to the, the problem. Am I understanding right. what you're saying correctly, or do you want to clarify? Yep. That's part of it. So the other part is that because mm -hmm. when you do have storm surges from the, the runoff from the fallouts and the community what used to be streams going into what is why now Waikiki and creating a marsh that was overwritten. <laughs> uh, and now you have a problem, but, but you just divert the water from those streams during storms um, away from the alloy. You know, and you've already got the existing um, plumbing probably, but there's nothing wrong with creating uh, pipes, and they had them above ground for a while there with Dr. Ingham Hahnemann, and uh, you can cover it with plants. You, you, you lose, you're gonna have a continuously losing battle. If all you're doing is building a wall, the water's gonna get around it. You don't know how high the, the, these oceans are gonna get. And, and besides, you ruin the Alawai and the golf course. It's a beautiful area. I love driving down the Alawai and, and seeing the water. I mean, why ruin that? And, and you're going to do the same thing like as you did in Louis, uh, New Orleans and build a wall behind all of these expensive hotels and condos? And you're going to undermine those foundations when the water gets into Waikiki, no matter what you do. So the, the, I see the solution is a dam and these engineers can build it. I'm not an engineer, but they can build it so that the water does go one way out and can't come back in. And it's not a very big area, so it, it wouldn't be as expensive as two walls on either side of the alloy, and I don't know what you're going to do at the end of the alloy. You're ruining Waikiki if you build walls on either side of the alloy. So that's my solution, and I think it's a good one. Of course, only the engineers will determine that. Thanks for your input, Amy. Um, just to make sure I understand what I heard you saying, there were a couple key points. So one, the idea of a one-way valve perhaps inserted into a dam at the Alawai exit into the ocean. And the key factor there being to release water without having water from like storm surge come back in and cause more flooding in Waikiki. 
Um, and then also point two to divert water from the streams that are tributary to the Alawai. Divert that water um, in pipes. You were suggesting that could be above ground, maybe cover them with plants to exit directly into the ocean. And the third key point or, or was the be concerned about yeah, or, or have a beach. Okay, so to move the water somewhere else, either directly into the ocean or farther west. Um, okay, and then the concern about the wall would involve like maintaining the wall, that the wall could be overtopped. The wall, and with the overtopping, putting Waikiki at risk of flooding, and then also this impacting the building, building. And costly to build. Amy? Hold on, I moved away from my computer. <laughs> I'm on the phone oh. too. Okay, uh, there's going to be billions spent if on a wall. And it's going to be ongoing expenses to who? To the city. <laughs> uh, to us. Build, you know, if they can build Hoover Dam, they can build a dam at the end of the LOI Canal. That's it. Got it. So I hear you saying some of the drawbacks about a wall along the Alawai. Wouldn't that just be the aesthetics and putting Waikiki at risk of flooding, but the expense to construct and the expense to maintain? And those are it's some of the issues be, they yes. see with the wall. Yes. Okay. Excellent. Thank, Thank you, you, Amy. Uh, great point. Any other any other thoughts about solutions or um, how the the planning team is evaluating solutions while we while we still have you on the line? No, I just really think that that possible option needs to be seriously considered, and that uh, you should never have water higher above ground behind your most expensive buildings in the entire state of Hawaii. Water always wins, and I wouldn't take that gamble. It's not just above ground. Okay. You know, uh, there's plenty of places on Oahu and other places where the water goes underground. And if, if you know, that, that's, that's definitely true on the hills. Thank you, Amy. Um, Thank you. Hey, Elliot, do you have any do you have any other feedback to some of Amy's comments before we move on to the next comment? I, I don't. So, you know, a gated structure at the front of the alloy is definitely something that's under consideration. Uh, looking at how we expand capacity to move water through the alloy, including additional outlets. Um, I think that in, in previous versions, uh, they had looked at something that was referred to as the Makiki bypass. So instead of channeling all of the, the water from the Makiki stream into the Alawai uh, to look for other alternatives to let that out into the ocean. Um, and, and so I can say that these, these options are absolutely on the, on the table. Um, you, know, you know, our analysis obviously has not proceeded to the point where, where we, we can figure out what, is, what are the costs of some of those features um, or how would they operate? But uh, I really appreciate your comments, Amy, and, and I think that um, those are things that will absolutely be analyzed and incorporated into this feasibility study. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, I Amy. Thank you, Elliot. Yes. Um, are you aware of community solutions for urban flood resilience? Uh, this is um, something I just looked up on uh, ArcGIS story maps. You know, it talks about urban flooding, but also coastal flooding. And, you know, are you looking at best practices that are being employed on the mainland? Yeah, I, I can uh, I can address that. Not just the mainland. We are looking at uh, at global case studies uh, in terms of how other similar environments. Uh, have dealt with these types of issues. And so we're looking at what types of um, solutions have highly urbanized areas put in place to try to deal with their flood, um, their flood problems. 
we're looking at uh, areas with similar topography, uh, similar um, rainfall patterns, so really heavy over short periods of time, concentrated in small areas. And, and we're looking to see how others have met some of those challenges. Um, I think that um, even, even more so than on the mainland, I, I think that uh, what we've seen is definitely Europe and Asia have, have been more in the forefront of kind of creative problem solving for some of these solutions. So we're absolutely uh, looking to those case studies to see where success has been achieved and, and where we think that some of those same principles might be able to be applied uh, in the alloy. So thank you for your comment. Yeah, could you post some of those like best practices or applicable solutions on the city website? Yeah, and, and so um, you're on the phone. Um, so uh, we'll capture that in the notes. Um, if you don't see it, feel free to follow up with an email. We're developing an FAQ and a series of resources for the community as well. Um, and so we're, we're going to try to capture as much information as we can uh, to ensure that we're providing as, you, you know, complete transparency in the process as we move forward. Um, so I, I absolutely think that that is something that, that we can start to pull together uh, best management practices uh, in particular. Um, and, and we'll figure out how to share that within the resources of the of the website. So again, um, if you if you don't see something or you don't see what you were looking for, please feel free to follow up with an email, um, and that'll go out to the entire study team as well. Okay. So, what are some of the like the comparable like case studies that would be, you know, because this particular story map does mention, you know, you have the urban flooding from storms, but also the tidal surge too. And it mentions that University of Texas and University of Maryland have been doing research. Sorry, it took me a second to come off of mute. Um, so I'll say from a case study t standpoint, uh, We've been looking at Southeast Asian cities, Hong Kong, uh, Singapore. Uh, we've also looked at Tokyo uh, for large urban areas. I think probably Singapore and Hong Kong are a little bit more equivalent in terms of the level of precipitation that they see, uh, but there's a lot of research out there. And so if you're seeing links uh, that you think are applicable or interesting, I, the team would really appreciate you to forward those on because you know, with the volume of information out there, it's impossible for us to be comprehensive. And so, uh, you know, as the community is engaged and participating in this, um, please feel free to, to not assume that we know these things um, and to share them with us. I think it would help the community too, just to see, you know, examples, because because there's so much information out there with the internet um, and would make things more, um, efficient or effective when you want community input, when you have an educated, you know, you've educated the residents. So thank you. Hey, thank you for sharing your comments. Uh, to follow up on what Ellie was saying, um, that the the website, so to share via email, that email address is in the chat box. That is alawai, all one word, at honolulu.gov. That's alawai at honolulu.gov. Check the website, that's honolulu.gov slash alawai. And the alawai is all one word. So to check the website for the FAQ section where some of the uh, public input ha is, is being placed and um, so that folks can confirm, yes, we, we did hear you and hear some of the suggestions that were put forward to, to help, um, like, like you were putting forward uh, to, to educate the residents and have an informed dialogue. So thank you for your comments. Um, and the time we have left, any, anybody else have some, some input on solutions or other, other questions?
So for those folks on the phone, um, well, for those folks that have joined the web meeting, if sharing over the phone is not your favorite, you can uh, feel free to, to chat it in. Um, you can either share, you can also share input um, either now or later via the email for the project. That is alawai at honolulu.gov. Um, and you can check and see some of the input provided during this meeting and Wednesday's meeting and the last round of public engagement 2019. Um, that'll be included in some of the FAQ on the website. And that is honolulu.gov slash alawai. So for those folks on the phone, oh, and another way to share input is via crowdsource reporter in a small nutshell that is providing comments, um, providing comments that you can then attach that comment to a specific point on the map. So if you're like, I don't know if anyone else has noticed, but so in, in my case, I have observed that there is road flooding at a specific intersection that I drive through to get to work and to get out of my neighborhood. Um, and so I shared that specific location with a comment that I've observed road flooding in this location. So that's something that can be used, uh, that, that crowdsource reporter in particular can be useful. For any folks that are just joining us, um, thank you. Thank you for taking the time out and, and your, your efforts and your civic duty to inform the project. Uh, we kicked today's web meeting off with a presentation sort of explaining what is the project, why do we need it, and where are we now if relative to public engagement and, and the project that happened in 2019. Briefly, the, the primary difference is that um, this round of the project, we're able to evaluate um, the, the impacts and potential solutions to uh, not just the 100 year storm, but also smaller, but, but still potentially devastating um, 10, 25 and 50 year storms. So we've gone through a, a breakout session uh, here for, for folks in this, this main room um, to discuss problems and some Q&A. And the primary focus of the session that we're currently going through is building a solution. So do you have any thoughts on um, some of the solutions that have been brought up so far, either on Wednesday's um, meeting or during uh, today's meeting thus far, or any thoughts on some of the solutions that have been uh, brought up, um, any solutions that have been brought up from the, the 2019 public engagement. So right now we're discussing solutions. So for those folks um, on the web meeting, please feel free to chat stuff in or make a point in the crowdsource reporter or you can um, provide comments via email to alawai at honolulu.gov. And for those folks on the phone that uh, would rather share verbally over the phone, let's do this. Now's the time. So I am trying to send little invitations to unmute for those folks just joining us by phone. Hey, Hey, this is Dyson. Sorry, I'm, I'm, we're having a little bit, uh, for some reason, WebEx is not allowing me to close the breakouts. So what I'm doing is I'm, I'm asking, okay, here we are. Now I've got it. I don't know why, for some reason, it was not allowing me to do that. Now I've done that. So uh, hopefully those folks will be, a few folks left, they'll be joining us. Tyson, I want to just uh, say goodbye. So we'll get everybody yes, back on the call because I got that hot out. I've got to get to it. You, you, I'll take my cue from you, sir. Don't worry. Okay, it looks like there's a couple more folks um, in a couple breakouts, uh, but they should be coming on in about 30 seconds. Um, meanwhile, um, Mr. Wotase asked about some examples of natural and nature-based solutions. Oh, okay, Jeff, Jeff has answered that in the chat. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a wide range of things that fall under that category, um, you know, uh, so, so we'll be looking at all of those. Obviously, uh, as has been mentioned, a lot of folks have suggested some of those for us to consider, uh, and so we certainly will do that. So we got three seconds to, there we are. Okay, Mr. Mayor, uh, the floor is yours, sir. 
Yeah, thank you, Tyson. I, I, look, I just want to, I had a hot out at three o'clock. I was only able to spend a couple of hours and I don't know how much longer this will go today, but I found the last two hours fascinating. So my closing comments are somewhat uh, the same as my opening comments and my, my appreciation for everybody that's on this call today, you know, for your caring, your concern. I think in the spirit of this Thanksgiving season, I have a real sense of gratitude as I commented in this last breakout session, just reading the chat room alone and the ideas that are coming up on what's being said and the, and the knowledge that's on this call um, is inspiring to say the least. And so, as we said at the outset, you know, we're here today to gain perspective of fresh perspectives, not looking backwards, only looking forward and to build trust. And um, I want you to know that as far as the city and county is concerned, what our partners, the Army Corps of Engineers, we plan to exhaust our energies here at looking at anything and everything before we come back to you, to try and develop the best ideas. But I want to say it again in closing, we need to make this project happen somehow, some way. And I want you to know the city and county is absolutely committed to doing everything we can to make that a reality. So I thank you for all of the, all of the caring and all of the, uh, the effort everybody here has made. Tyson, Colonel Marshall, thank you very much. I'm sorry I've got to leave. I, got, I, I, they, I don't know if it was because we had Thursday off or not, but somebody confused Saturday with Thursday. But my day is full today, but it's been a great couple of hours, and Wednesday night was even more so. The whole thing has been great. So thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Appreciate your time. All right. All right, thank you all, everybody, for, for those discussions. I was jumping in and out of different rooms. Some really great questions, really great discussions. You know, one thing that came up, um, I think it was in Kelly's room, was, um, you know, the mayor actually commented on it. Um, just how remarkably knowledgeable and passionate uh, this community is. Um, this is, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, you, this is not your first rodeo. So there's that, but you know this is very uh, unusual. In a lot of ways, I think if you consider, if you consider that fact, um, and also how engaged uh, the mayor and his administration are, um, you know this is a, it's hard to find better conditions than that really, for for a project like this. It, that's you know that's an ideal situation, to have an engaged community and engaged uh, sponsor, uh, you know working. Everybody's working together uh, um, in the same direction. Um, so thank you all again uh, for that, uh, for your inputs there. Now I'm going to I'm going to pull up my notes first of all. For some reason they disappear occasionally. Okay. And I know that there were also some people had some issues with Crowdsource Reporter. Um, I'm going to talk to our GIS guy on Monday and we'll get some of those ironed out. Please do feel free to email me directly uh, if you, you know, if you have technical issues, if those continue and you want some help, I can work with you one on one um, to, to iron that out. Okay, so we come to our Q&A session. Um, and uh, so again, just some quick reminders of the ground rules, you know, post your questions in the chat. Again, you can also raise your hand, just roll over, mouse over your name in the participant list, and there's a little hand there. You can raise your hand, um, keep your audio on mute unless you're speaking, and again, um, try to keep your comments and questions to a maximum of three minutes at a time um, so that your colleagues uh, also have a chance uh, to participate. Um, oh, that's the one. I did that last time, didn't I? Okay, so at this point, um, I'd like to just open up the floor uh, to anyone who has any questions. I see there's already some uh, discussion in the chat. Um, if anybody would like to elaborate on something maybe that they put in the chat uh, verbally, feel free to do that. Okay, Jimmy has raised his hand. Jimmy, why don't you uh, speak up? Yeah, I'm just curious, Tyson, if you could provide a little bit more clarity and detail as to next steps uh, with regards for the scheduling. Um, slide number 12 from your presentation posted online 
shows that the next phase of public meetings is not until May or July of next year. Uh, I know in our small group, you said there's going to be some other opportunities. So I was wondering if you could provide more detail with regards to that. Sure. So um, we're not quite ready to announce what those plans are yet, but I can tell you that very soon, you know, by the time that crowdsource reporter closes on December 12th, if not earlier, uh, we will announce some more plans. Basically, we would, you know, we we agree um, that there needs to be more opportunities, um, you know, for, for more public engagement and input. Um, and so we're we're trying to figure out exactly what that's going to look like um, and what that schedule will be. So we will uh, release that information as soon as we get all that pinned down. So rest assured, it will be well before. Next yeah, and, and Tyson, I can tackle a little bit of the, the his question about next steps. Um, sure. And so, yeah, so our technical team is um, initially, we're starting to look at um, each of the sub watersheds. So the Makiki, the Manoa, and the Palolo. Um, we're starting to, to look at, you know, we have the existing model that was developed as, as part of the last iteration of, of this, this process. And so we have a good existing model. And so what we can do is start looking at, okay, under, you know, some of those storm events, like the 25 year, the 10, um, the 50, flood, 50 year floods, those types of events, you know, what are the volumes of water that we're looking at? Um, and what measures or what, you know, features might, might we be able to implement throughout the watershed? So we're taking all the input from previous iterations of the study, all the input we're garnering during these public meetings about problems, opportunities, and possible solutions. And then we're also developing uh, some additional solutions and, and opportunities of our own, right? And so we're going to start looking at those measures in each of those sub watersheds just to try to get a handle of, as to, you know, what features might be able to function under what flood events and so forth. Um, and so, so that's kind of the next phase, developing those those measures and those features, and then and then start screening them out, right? Which ones appear to work and which ones won't. Um, and then ultimately, that's going to take us through the next couple months, probably until January or so. And then um, we're going to have a, you know, we'll, we'll be out on the out on the ground and looking at those areas through a site visit as well. And so, um, so anyway, that's kind of the next steps, right? But but Tyson mentioned, um, you know, we are looking at opportunities to engage um, the public in other avenues kind of between now and then. Um, and then I, I also want to kind of talk about the next formal public engagement in terms of the four phase engagement that I laid out on this slide right here. Um, you know, that May, July timeframe engagement really will be when we've had a chance to fully develop that list of measures and then start screening those out and develop what we'll call an array of alternatives, right? What do we believe are a series of alternatives that, that may work? And so, at that point, you know, when we've been screening measures and start developing those alternatives is when we really want to engage the public again and say, hey, here's what we're looking at. Here's what's been screened. Um, here's what remains. Here's how we think they can be combined. Provide some additional feedback, right? That's a great opportunity for, for the community to come back and say, well, you know, we think these plans are missing this or have you considered this, right? And so it's another opportunity for us to, to get input and make sure that our alternatives, you know, effectively capture all of your concerns, if that makes sense. Over. Thanks, Eric. And, and yeah, you know, this is one thing we're, we're hoping to be able to communicate through this process with you all, um, uh, you know, about that, you know, as we're going through the, the alternatives and screening things and, and so that, you know, so that it's not happening in a black box that you then, you know, see the, the output in, in June or whenever it is, uh, you know, we're hoping to make that um, give you more chance to input and engage during that process and, you know, um, have a little transparency there. Um, you know, one of the things, of course, that happens in that process is we start off, as Eric said, at kind of a course level of analysis of screening, and then we increase the, the detail as we go. Um, so, you know, we'll also be looking for input uh, from you all about, uh, you know, how you think you know, if we've con maybe there's something that you feel that we didn't consider, for example, um, that would be certainly input that we would welcome. Um, but anyway, um, I, I, and I, I saw that Sam had a follow up question for you, Eric, um, just asking about how many how many alternatives will we develop? Is, is there a, you know, a typical number or uh, how does that work? 
So that's a really good question, um, and, and I think it can be extremely variable, and it can all and and it's also it's a partially a function of the number of potentially viable measures throughout the watershed, and so you know I, we we can only analyze so many, and 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 really through our planning process, it's iterative, right? So we kind of go through the planning process of developing measures, screening them out, formulating alternatives, looking at those, some of those won't work, we can reformulate again. And so through the iterative process, we generally come up with five or six or so alternatives that you know we believe ha are viable. And, so, and that again, um, you said a rough estimate. I, I, I'm not trying to say that we're gonna have five or six alternatives, right? Again, it's, it can be extremely variable. Um, but again, we can't, we can't analyze hundred alternatives we just don't have the time right and there's really probably not a hundred viable alternatives out there and so uh, what I will say is that through the iterative planning process um, we're able to kind of hone in on uh, on those alternatives that are most viable and would provide the most benefit and so those are ultimately the ones that, that we kind of carry forward into our final analytical phase over and one alternative can comprise multiple measures right that's correct. Absolutely. And, and thanks, Tyson. What, an alternative is, generally speaking, um, a series of measures throughout the watershed, right, that, that are a holistic alternative that reduce risk throughout the entire watershed. Um, an alternative, generally speaking, is, will not be one measure in one of the sub-basins, for example. It will be a holistic, a holistic um, series of alternatives that reduce risk throughout the watershed. Over. Right, a systemic approach. Um, There's a question from Mike. Um, Mike says uh, the state legislature funds DLNR and with limited funding cannot properly address forest restoration. How do we bring the state of Hawaii and DLNR forestry native forest restoration funding into this process? Anyone want to take a crack at that? Hey, uh, Tyson, this is Jeff. So. I was a little slow to the answer, uh, but I did put uh, an answer in, in the chat, and there's actually two answers. Number one, through this process, um, reforestation, as, as previously discussed, if you have um, less debris coming down, if you have lower sediment coming down, then you have less uh, risk of debris blockage. So you can tie reforestation directly into flood risk management measures um, to a certain extent. And then the other uh, opportunity is through our Ecosystem Restoration Authority that I talked about earlier that specifically addresses creating habitat opportunities for things like the black line damselfly, um, like um, uh, the native birds that are native to Hawaii and regionally um, significant. So there's two answers there. Number one, through this study, and number two, through our Ecosystem Restoration Authority, which we've communicated with um, not only the city and county, but also with the uh, state of Hawaii uh, legislature, but also with groups um, like uh, Alawai Watershed Collaboration, and I'm gonna throw her under the bus, and I'm sorry, but we do have um, some folks with us, uh, Casey Maslin from the Alawai Water Shade Collaboration is participating with us tonight. And so she's capturing all of this um, because her group working with Hawaii Green Growth is, is working on initiatives like that. So it's important for us to bring that up. Thank you. Now, I'm glad that you mentioned that, Jeff, because um, that is something I think that needs to be considered is obviously we are not the only game in town and we're not gonna do everything. And so as the community, you know, as you all think about suggestions for this study and, you know, for us to look at, um, you know, if you can think about sort of what's appropriate for the, you know, for the Corps of Engineers to do um, and what are things that, that our partners can do, that other groups can do, that the community can do themselves and, and to try to kind of come up with a, you know, like Eric was saying, like a holistic system, right? A systemic approach where we can sort of um, combine efforts. Um, you know, that would be the ideal ideal way to do it. Uh, Sydney asks, uh, can't we have both at the same time? Uh, Sydney, sorry, I, I, what are you referring to there? Can you clarify? 
Jeff had mentioned that the Army Corps has that other arm. So why can't we be working with both arms at the same time? So the yeah, and I'll answer that. Um, and and um, I think maybe it was you, maybe it was somebody else at the outset of this meeting asked about um, that a similar question. And what I'll tell you is is that. Um, we worked on an effort uh, significantly up until 2012 when, when uh, we were directed to rescope the study that had a lot of that ecosystem. And um, the current administration under Mayor Blangiardi, um, they're new to the table. They're trying to sort through this, uh, a lot of information. And so we're looking for those opportunities um, for us to submit those. But the core doesn't work unilaterally. Uh, we have to have a study partner and we have to have a request. And so whether it comes from a nonprofit organization um, that's uh, able to, to partner with us, whether it comes from the state of Hawaii or whether it comes from the city and county of Honolulu. Um, we can make um, the suggestion and we can assist in developing the request, but ultimately we have to have a partner on that study. And, and to date, we have not been able to receive or request uh, any such study um, to focus on ecosystem restoration. Jeff. Can I make a comment? Jeff? Um, Please? And Army Corps. Are, yes, who is that? Ellen. This is Ellen Watson. Hey, Ellen. Go Hi. for it. Um, well, because we are given these two opportunities for the community to weigh in, and then there's going to be a long stretch of time where you guys are all going to think about this. So it's going to be the Army Corps guys, and it's going to be um, the mayor and Alex and Matt, I guess, on the city side. So I would like um, for for the group as far as 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 in the alternative analysis and and in your discussions and in the bringing of your plan, I I would like to ask that three people be admitted to that process. And those people would be Sydney Lynch and Sean Connolly and Dave Watasi, because they're very good on the mapping and the evaluation analysis side. And we, the community, trust them because they've been part and parcel of our community activities all the time. So we community people want some community people at the table. We don't just want the Army Corps and the mayor's administration to huddle. Um, we, we just want some eyes and ears on that and people to give you input in that because we, the community, won't, won't have um, any input on this at all till you come and give us, you know, I hope or I fear will be a dog and pony show about what features you decide to to do and what things you decide to stick in our stream. And, and I just think that we, I think it has to be better than that. And if Army Corps can't welcome that in, then I would ask the mayor to welcome that in because you're asking us to tr redevelop trust. Maybe we didn't even have to trust you in the first place. So we, I think we need some folks at that table all the way along that can give us feedback uh, until you hold some other formal sessions and that will help us trust the whole process. Hey, Alan, uh, I appreciate that comment. Um, we were talking a little bit earlier about um, the fact that we, we agree that waiting until June is not gonna cut the mustard. Uh, so we are talking about doing more. Sorry, we've got, I think, a hot mic there. Anyway, um, so we're talking about doing uh, some more uh, opportunities so that the whole community um, will have a chance to engage and provide input and to see what we're doing, to get a glimpse into the process um, and participate. So it's not going to be, uh, you know, we're not going to make you wait. We're not going to have a black box that you're just going to see the end result of. Uh, we really want to open this up uh, for everybody. Um, and, you know, the, the, I, I should mention that um, uh, the mayor's administration has um, said, you know, that they don't want 
to privilege any one stakeholder's access over anyone else's. So what we're what we would like to do is to provide opportunities for the whole community uh, to engage in that um, as you know as much as possible. Hey, hey Ellen, this is Jeff. I, I just want to add one thing. Do that. They they can help you with the analytics because they have skills there, or they can help you with the mapping because they have skills there. And all of the stakeholders don't have that. I have no skills there, but I want people I trust exercising their skills with you, not to be presented to. Yeah, I mean, I I can't do that, but we know and trust people that can. So Jeff, help us out. Yeah, and Ellen, I, I just wanna touch, I don't think anyone on this call who's from the community would say that from, 1999 to 2017 that the core did an adequate job of, of community outreach and it wasn't due to a lack of trying because we did hold several engagements with different stakeholders the difference between then and now that the lesson that we've learned is is we have to lean on the city and county to identify who are those appropriate stakeholders because um, we engaged with the Bishop Museum, who actually did our environmental modeling the last time, and then come to find out there's lots of folks in the community that, that um, found flaws and errors in said modeling. And so we have to lean on our partners in the city and county, and, and with this administration, we have that leadership, we have that support. Um, from our perspective, we can't tell you what your perspective is. Uh, Director Gonzer is on this call right now, although the mayor has dropped off. But the city and county, we're going to go to them and they're going to identify um, A, key stakeholders that we need to be engaged with and B, what are our uh, limitations as far as scope and fiscal constraints from their perspective. And so I would encourage you as well as everybody else on the phone um, to communicate with your leadership through the, your neighborhood boards. Uh, Ian from the uh, Makiki board is on tonight. We had the uh, Diamond Head board represented the other night. So, so engage your leaders and your community representatives to make sure that you have your voice being heard. Because if you lean on the core to do it as hard and as much as we want to do it, we can't get everybody because we don't know everybody. So that's where our partnership is so critical with the city and county. And they've stepped up to the plate thus far. Hey Jeff, specifically is DLNR Forestry have a seat at the table or being asked to get directly involved? We have invited as well as um, they are more than welcome at DLNR um, because there's not only the forestry aspect, there's the dam safety aspect of it. There's also the floodplain management aspect under chapter 179 of the Hawaii revised statute. So they have a seat at the table if they want to participate. However, um, we need them to voluntarily come to the table and participate. Thank you, and uh, because DLNR Forestry knows that forest better than anybody and uh, can, can add a lot of technical input. Roger that. So we have about five minutes left in our scheduled time. We can, of course, go over that uh, if there's a need for it. I don't know if there is because we've got a smaller group, but certainly willing to do that. If folks want to keep uh, conversation going. Um, other questions? Please, this is Henry Trapador Rosenthal. Yes. I, I put in the chat a question about the, the patchwork of jurisdictions along the stream beds. Has that been addressed today? I was late to the meeting. Uh, can you clarify the question? Sorry. Address in what way? Um, with with um, state and city and county and perhaps private um, jurisdiction over stretches of Manoa streams banks. Um, that seems like a problem to me. I wonder if it's been addressed. Henry, not today specifically. It came up in a lot of the group discussions on Wednesday night. Uh, and not just the stream banks itself, literally the, the 
the center line or the bottom of the stream. There is a lot of um, robust discussion around stream maintenance and recognition that, as you know, across all of the streams around the island, you know, there's not one sole public um, authority or ownership over a stream corridor. So, though it didn't come up today, at least not in my small group discussion or in the sort of plenary here, it was obviously recognized and, and folks are acutely aware of that more so on the maintenance side, let alone um, on ultimate project features. Thanks, Thanks Matt, for jumping in. I appreciate it. All right, other questions? I had a question about rivering only. Eric said sure. the Army Corps can do rivering only. That sounds like a real scary thing. So that means to me that you can only put levees or detention basins or terrible things in the stream because your focus has to be on the streaming water. So what happens with just rainwater or ocean rise water or some kind of tropical storm thing that that we have flooding problems beyond just the stream? Yeah. So. If you could clarify that. That's a very good yeah. question. I'll ask Eric to answer that. Yeah, thanks, Alan. Um, so when I say riverine flooding, essentially what I'm talking about is flooding originating on the mountain side of the canal. So it incorporates rainwater. So, you know, what I mean riverine flooding in that regard. Understanding, though, that, you know, water coming down from the mountains and enters the canal, which is also influenced by the sea, right? By sea level rise, by the tides. And so we can consider sea level, you know, tidal influences and sea level rise to the extent that they affect water coming down from the mountains, if that makes sense. And so we're absolutely considering all the rainwater that, that comes in. We're not focused only on, you know, I mean, I say riverine, it's not like we're focused purely on the stream channel itself. Um, but so I, I hope that clarifies. Essentially, we mean flooding from the Malka side of the canal, understanding that that is also influenced by tidal, by tidal processes, and we can, we can consider those as well to the extent they impact that riverine flooding. Does that help? Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, that's, that's some critical details there. Other other questions? Eric, I'll just add to that that the riverine flooding also impacts the coastline, uh, coral reefs, and the ecosystem along the coast. So um, Waikiki used to capture most of that through a wetland um, prior to the canal and now we don't capture it. So we've not only introduced species into the forest that contribute to erosion, that erosion is now destroying more and more shoreline um, environment. So I think it, it's really important to consider not only sea level rise, but also how do we uh, restore some of the ecosystems that occurred, albeit with all this development that occurred with it. Thanks for that, Mike. Understood. Good. Yeah, good points. Yeah, so I, I do want to um, if I, I do want to address this question of sort of who's at the table um, and who's part of the planning team and that kind of thing. Um, I don't know how much I, I you know uh, the. I think the key point is that you know the city and the core are the are the partners that are the planning team um, and if you wanted to have for example i think I think that a lot of what I'm hearing is a desire for for a citizens advisory council um, and that is something that has been used very effectively in other projects and other studies. Um, it does take a lot of effort to set up. There are a lot of laws that govern it. Um, 
And I believe that that would be something that would be up to the city and the county to take care of. Um, so if, if that's something that you're, that, you know, you guys are interested in, certainly uh, communicate that with the administration. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I certainly understand the desire for that. On the one hand, you do have a champion, you know, an elected official in, in, in the mayor uh, who's, who's on the team um, and his delegate, obviously. But, um, but yeah, if you wanted to have additional representatives of the community, then that sounds like that is kind of what you guys are asking for. Um, so that might be something that you all can look, look into. Um, okay, I see a lot of activity in, in, the, in the chat. Um, does anybody want to bring that into verbal discussion as well? Sydney, it looks like your question was, was answered finally there. Okay, good. Yeah, Thank so you, let, me, let me make this point um, yeah. because it's not only protect our Hawaii watershed. You also have Hawaii Exemplary Foundation. You also have the University of Hawaii at Manoa. You also have Halau Kumana. You also have Kumo Ola. You also you you have uh, Kamehameha. You have lots and lots of nonprofit organizations in the watershed uh, who are undertaking activities. So if you want to partner with the Corps of Engineers and you have legal standing to do so for ecosystem restoration because you're a property owner, um, as well as you have the legal standing of a 50C, 503C organization, then you can present a letter of request to us. However, there's a 50-50 cost sharing requirement for the study, which is still better than you paying for the study 100% on your own and you bring the expertise of the core behind you. And then for implementation, depending as to what the project is, um, there is a cost sharing requirement there to do. Or Dave Watasi put in the chat, you can go through the city and county and get the city and county, the mayor, to request the study and to appoint you as the representative of the city and county. That's another option for you. But in both of those cases, it requires a request from a non-federal partner and then an authorization from the Corps in order to move forward and, and um, participate in those activities. That summarizes that conversation. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate so, that. So you have to own property, Jeff. You did say you, you have to be a nonprofit and you have to own property as well. The nonprofit has to own property. You either have you either have to own property, uh, own the property that you're or you have to have. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Fuzzed out. <laughs> Could you put that in the chat? I couldn't hear you. Sorry. Yeah, you dropped off there a little bit, your audio, Jeff. Yeah, sorry about that. My headphones died. Um, to answer your question, you either have to be the property owner in which you're trying to implement the project, or you have to have a letter of support from that property owner, whether it's the state DLNR, whether it's um, the city and county of Honolulu, whether it's a, um, um, a school um, like Kamehameha, uh, in order so to implement the project. So it's site specific, so we would have to own the whole Alawai watershed if we wanted to <laughs> to try and get a, pro a a project in that in the watershed. <laughs> no, ma'am. What you would do is, is you'd identify a a site and a project, and and I believe there's lots of opportunities already out there. So it's for, for only to, to, okay. I got and, it. And then and then and then you can um, okay. implement based off of funding and timing. Okay, so it's very very site specific. Okay. Okay, thank you. See, I'm learning a lot here too. So this is good. Um, okay, other questions? This is a really good discussion we're having here. Ah, Ellen, I, I see your hand. About... Yes. Can I, can I talk? It's okay. Um, you do, go for it. Thank you. What are the project constraints uh, because of the, the money? So it's an emergency supplemental monies from Congress. So what kind of constraints does that put on whatever your plan or whatever your project would be or what you can and cannot do that might restrict what community people will and will not suggest, right? So does the money itself 
has to put some parameters on something. Yes. So can you speak to that? Jeff, can you speak to that? <laughs> yeah, sure, Tyson. So um, the project has to be within the three valleys uh, previously identified, the Makiki, the Manoa, and the Palolo. The project has to be focused on drainage areas that, um, and this is probably the first time you all have heard this, but focus on drainage areas that have at least a flow of 800 cubic feet per second in a 10-year level of an event. That means anything less than that is considered by the Corps of Engineers as an interior drainage issue. That's very confusing, but what I will tell you is within our watershed here that we're talking about, the Makiki stream, the uh, Manoa stream, as well as the Pukele, the Waimau, and, and the confluence going down, all of those meet that requirement. So the other piece of that is um, it has to be tied to flood risk management and reduction measures. Now, everything else moving forward will be examined, analyzed, and then screened appropriately um, in order to achieve our benefit. I answered Jimmy's question earlier in the chat about um, incrementally. So if we identify that in, in one stream, damage doesn't occur until the 100-year event, and it costs an exorbitant amount of money and is very environmentally or community unwilling, then we're not going to look at that. But in another area, it may be um, that damage occurs at a much lower event, and it's much more cost-effective to address it, and so we will focus on those particular areas. So the, the boundaries right now are there, they're wide, and they will continue to move in and constrain as we move forward. And Jeff, Sidney asked about how, how do we know those flow rates? Is there a USGS gauge or something? How, how do we do that? Uh, Eric, Eric answered. Okay, our models can tell us. Hey, Jeff, how do you overcome this ultimate decision on whether to make a 100-year, 50-year, 30-year uh, design? Uh, how long do you see that taking and who ultimately makes that call? So over the next nine months, we will evaluate the economic, environmental, and, and community risks associated with different levels of events, and we will optimize um, the recommendation based off of that information. And so around September of 2022 is when we will make a recommendation to the city and county of Honolulu, as well as to the vertical, our leadership in Washington, D.C., who have to both agree to move forward with that plan only to take it to the next step, which is to the, uh, do a public release and resource agency release um, for, for further comment um, and, and to make a decision whether or not this is the plan we want to invest on. So um, right now, we're probably looking around nine months before we are at a point where we're ready to say we're going to focus on a 4% 25-year event or a 2% a 50-year event or, or something larger or something smaller. Good question and good answer, Jeff. Thanks. I see a question coming in from Ryan. Um, apologies, perhaps this was covered earlier, but can this study consider implementation of dual purpose infrastructure such as a new roadway, multi use path, or other transportation facility that also fundamentally serves as a flood risk management purpose? Uh, can the Corps work with the, you know, Federal Highways or Federal Transit Administration, for example? So, Ryan Tam is from the Ala Moana Kaka'ako Board, um, and, and I've had the opportunity to talk with him a few times. And so, um, Ryan, to answer your question, um, unfortunately, that's kind of a loaded question, and it's way too early in the process. Um, because depending as to what features we recommend, they may inherently have those dual purpose features already associated with them, in which case we can count them for what we call recreational benefits, such as a path on top of a berm or a walkway, uh, something along those lines. But until we kind of more identify what those um, features are going to be, we can't tell you um, whether or not it's a, a um, dual purpose for the purpose of economic justification or whether it's dual purpose um, as a betterment paid for by the federal or non-federal sponsor. So unfortunately, we don't fully have that answer yet. 
Hey, Sydney, it looks, I, I think you've got a question. Is that right? No. <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay. Um, I, I think you did ask. Sorry, a I just, uh, I, that brings up another example of where like Department of Transportation is a state agency proceeding with a pedestrian bridge. Um, not so much in synchronicity with the Army cars look at a pump gate. So if you can have a pedestrian bridge with a pump gate, then you've got a win-win maybe. But now you've got the State Department of Transportation, the State Department of Land and Natural Resources, the city and county, the, the U.S. Army Corps. So it, it seems like it's always been this challenge to bring all these agencies together. Um, and that, that pedestrian bridge was a perfect example of that to me, that challenge. I thought all agencies at all levels always coordinated perfectly together and there were never a, yeah, yeah, I hear you. <laughs> okay, Sydney, Sydney uh, did ask a question about um, sharing the model and, and Eric answered that we, we share our models with the, with the sponsor. Uh, Sydney has had a follow up of, can you share them with the public too? If not, why not? So I guess, let me ask Sydney this question. Are you looking to find the methodology the calibration and, and the outputs and everything from the model, or are you actually looking to try and run the model yourself? No, I because, can't run the model ourselves, but yeah. I, I was looking just to, because you said it was 800 or whatever, so I'd just be interested to know what the different rates are for the different streams. Is it 801, 900, 1000? That's kind of what yeah. I'm interested in. So, you know. No, I, I, I totally understand. And to answer your question simply, um, in, the, in, in the draft report that comes out, um, there will be a draft appendix that has a lot of that data in there that you're asking for, um, and we're required to put that kind of information in there. Um, but as as far as actually running the models, it's it's very cumbersome and um, yeah, not asking to run yeah, the model. Not, it's asking because you, you 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 have the you said you have the data already, so that's why I was wondering if we could just see it. I mean, so actually, um, for that particular data. Um, the old feasibility study, as well as the EDR, had that data in it um, yeah. for the hydrology yeah. that you can look and see what those different stream rates are. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay. I think we can stay on maybe a maximum of another 15 minutes uh, if needed. And I think Jeff would be helpful as you work your way towards that um 50 year 25 year decision to bring the community along with it because that as far as flow rates and trying to simplify to the community what that might mean with detention basins not you know getting rid of them keeping them what size they are um so i know it's it's a lot of uh, engineering and and data collection and, uh, but to get to that decision along with the community is just kind of bring them along with, okay, we're, we're only looking at a 50 year now that's going to significantly reduce this, this, and this, um, maybe not, uh, zeros and ones, but just kind of a, a, a picture of what that might look like. So the community can wrap their head around it. Yeah, I, I agree with Mike because I think it's really important because you know, when the, the media came out with this, they're still touting the figures from the 100 year flood, which is 1.4 billion, 3,000 structures just got dis destroyed in Waikiki. But if what we're looking at is something totally different, I think it's really important to have a table of what you ex what kind of damage and, and dollars you expect at different flood levels and get that out to the public so that they're, they're not laboring under the, the misconception that this project is going to address that. 100 year level flood of, of damage. So, yeah. Yeah, so I can jump in and address some of that. Um, and, and understood, right? And I think we have the, the next on the, at least on the public engagement slide, right? We, we had a, that next formal public meeting around the May timeframe. And the purpose of that is to kind of discuss some of this, right? So d during that time, we'll have developed and screened a lot of these management measures. Um, and that will have been a lot of the analysis to kind of tell us, all right, well, wh which measures will work under which different um, flood events, right? Is it the 25, the 50, the 100? And so a lot of that information will be will be discussed at that time. Um, and, and so understood that it's really important to kind of have 
public understand what it is that we actually appear to like what we're looking at in terms of what floods we're thinking we might be able to kind of build towards. Um, the other thing I want to mention here too, and I, I mentioned this during our, our breakout with, with Mike, is that you know one level of protection might be more appropriate for a certain stream, right? Whereas another I say level of protection, but you know designing to a, a different type of flood might be more appropriate for another stream. So it's not like it has to be a hundred year across the board or fifty year across the board, right? So so one stream you might be able to design some measures for the twenty five year, and then another flood it might be seventy or the fifty year. And so, you know, we're not tied to a single number throughout the entire watershed. It's what makes the most economic sense for any individual area, as long as they holistically work together at the scale of the entire watershed. Um, I hope that makes sense as well. But again, all of that kind of is, is this coming phase. We're starting to do those analyses now to where we're saying, okay, what are the volumes of water under each flood event for each stream? Um, and then what measures can we, or might we be able to implement to either hold that water back, move that water through, uh, and so we're going to have a much better handle on what types of measures will be appropriate under what floods for each stream, if, if that makes sense. Over. I have a question. Um, with the other plan um, that we had going, um, all bets were off in a hurricane, right? So does that still hold up here and whatever plan you will invent. It is not going to work in a hurricane, so a hurricane is not going to be considered a flooding event because it's just overwhelming. Well, so I guess um her, you know, so I guess if you're talking about rainfall it's coming from a hurricane, um, you know, dumping in the mountains, resulting in river rain flooding, you know, our, our you know our models will Kind of take that into consideration, right? So a hurricane will result in a, I don't know, 50 year flood or a 100 year flood. So, so no, I mean, you know, hurricanes result in riverine flooding, which is what we are looking to address. Now, you know, if a hurricane were to result purely in coastal storm surge with no riverine flooding, maybe we wouldn't be able to, our, you know, the project that at the end of the day end up implementing, if we do, wouldn't be able to address that or wouldn't address that because it's purely coastal, right? And so we might not be able to implement a project that would address that. Um, but no, at the end of the day, hurricanes result in riverine flooding as well. And so, you know, we would, whatever project we implement at the end of the day would provide some level of risk reduction for that event. Over. Thank you both. Um, there's a question. Uh, uh, Dave Watase asks if uh, he says besides the the price tag and the EDR price tag, what objections did the current mayor have with your plan? Um, we certainly can't answer that. I, I, I wonder. And of course, he's he's off the call. Um, Matt, I don't know if that's something that you can answer or if that's something we'll just have to table. No, I probably need to table. It's a, that's a fair question, Dave. But as you heard from the mayor in the beginning, you know, he, he was catching up to speed just before the transition from the previous administration when, frankly, it was known about the price tag. So it was almost done before the, the new team came in. Appreciate it. Uh, Dave also asked, how did they do it in New Orleans? Uh, all the core stuff over there had to take into consideration the tide surge from a hurricane. And I would think it would be irresponsible and destined to fail if only looking at it from a meteorological event standpoint. Yeah, so um, understood. And is that you're absolutely correct in that, you know, storm surge and tidal flooding can influence how riverine flooding affects communities, right? And so for example, if you have a king tide, a flood coming down the, the mountains um, during a king tide, right, there's much less capacity in the canal at baseline, right? And so you might have it exacerbated flooding or worse flooding around the canal. And so, again, we will be considering those coastal influences to the extent that they um, interplay and interact with river, rivering flooding and, and result in worse rivering flooding. And so, so we're not completely discounting them. We are incorporating it into, into our analyses. Again, this is a flood risk management study as defined by the Army Corps of Engineers. And so it is riverine focused, um, kind of going back to the discussion with Ellen earlier, meaning the flooding originating from the Malchus side of the canal. 
Um, but again, fully, re you know, understand that, that riverine flooding is influenced by those tidal processes. And so we, we absolutely consider that. And sea, sea level rise being among those things that we consider, right? How will sea level rise impact um, the extent that riverine flooding impacts our, our communities? And so we'll be able to answer that question and we'll incorporate that question into our analyses and any, any project that ultimately arises. Over. Yeah, and I think there was the scale of the stuff going on in New Orleans was, you know, next level. Um, okay, got a few minutes left. Any any other questions, comments? Okay. All right. In that case, uh, I'd like to. Um, Ask the commander to, to say a few words uh, to close us out. So the floor is yours. Thanks, Tyson, and thanks. Uh, well, everybody, let me start with the, the, the city and county of Honolulu who are on this call, as well as my team, uh, that the larger team that has put this together. It really was top notch. And I want to thank all the residents and the public who engaged not only tonight, maybe for the for this afternoon for the first time, but also on Wednesday night. I mean, just really shows your commitment and passion to getting this right. Um, you're right there with us. I think we, together we make a, a great project delivery team. Um, I hope we've reiterated those couple themes I started with is that this is not the same project that we've been working on since 1999 and is now different, significantly so. And, um, and then secondly, we're listening. So hopefully that's been made abundantly clear. I realize we have to continue to demonstrate that and we will, um, that we're listening. We've, we've got your remarks um, and they're making a difference. So we're going we're gonna to look for ways to do that. Um, just really appreciate, as, as Mayor said, I, I, I've been in a lot of public meetings, and, and this stuff is flood risk management. I mean, it is one of those things that it, it, it's very impactful on people's lives, and it can also be life or death. And I've, I've, got, the, uh, I've got the background um, with that. In, in New Orleans, a lot of people have talked about that. So I'm just so glad that this is, this is handled so uh, respectfully and um, professionally. Um, it's, it's, the, it's given the, uh, well, the professional treatment that it deserves. That's all from me. Um, I guess I'll turn it over to Mr. Kozlov if he's still if he's still on for a final remark. I think he's dropped off, um, Matt. I think by, uh, by attrition, you are now <laughs> the designated uh, representative of the city. Do you want to say anything? Stepping up and stepping in. Uh, thanks, Tyson, and thank you um, uh, to the Army Corps and the team here. Obviously, you know. A lot of the people that I've been talking to in the small groups Wednesday and through through this this day, we've been talking about this project for a long time. Myself in different positions, different capacities as well. I think we we are learning now that we do have a unique opportunity, and the more that we sort of on the client and on the community side, we have a great opportunity to not just capitalize on what the Army Corps can provide for us in partnership, but also think about what we as a city and as a community can do across. Our other responsibilities in Kuliana for this watershed and for other watersheds. So these kinds of things are going to be really important learning opportunities as we transfer this information to think about climate change writ large around this island. So I very much look forward to the next steps and reengaging with folks as we move forward. Thank you, Matt. Really appreciate it. Um, so just to, you know some final thoughts. I mean, I don't have to ask you to please stay engaged. This group, I know you guys are super engaged. Um, and it, as we've said, it's so valuable for the study. Uh, really appreciate your participation. Um, if you have any feedback on how the workshops you know, went, send them to me directly. Again, if you have any issues with CrowdSource Reporter, again, you can email me directly. Um, we will uh, make sure that everything is up and running and working. Um, you know, on Monday, that's a, our first order of business. So you will have until at least December 12th to do that. Um, and, uh, oh, I still have this participate in our second workshop. Um, again, there will be more opportunities to engage beyond, you know, the, the minimum that, that was on that slide. Um, you're not gonna have to wait until June, uh, you know, we'll see you before then. So we will uh, announce here fairly soon what that's going to look like. We don't, we've got some ideas we don't know exactly yet, but we will announce that. And meanwhile, um, use the crowdsource reporter. 
uh, check the website for updates. It will be updated pretty frequently. Um, and if you have any anything else you want to, you know, questions or other input you want to provide to us, uh, aloi at honolulu.gov is open for business 24-7. So, um, again, yes, uh, Mr. Witasa asked, uh, a couple of folks asked if the uh, comments and the recording will be part of the public record. I believe they will be. So, um, yeah, again, thanks everyone so much for your participation and enjoy the rest of your weekend. Mahalo.